Back in August of 2023, we were staying at an Airbnb in Hatch, Utah. This place didn't have any air conditioning considering the elevation of Hatch and the temperature was pretty comfortable. This will be relevant later. Now, on the first night, my wife and I were out stargazing since the sky was devoid of light, pollution and clouds. I had my GoPro set up and my phone taking photos and we were just staring up enjoying the stars. That was when my wife pointed out to me what appeared to be a single small satellite floating across the sky. As we were looking at it, however, it then multiplied into three lights in a sort of triangle shape. It continued to expand in the same manner until there were about seven lights in a larger triangle pattern. That in and of itself is pretty weird, right? But what really was just bizarre was the sky that was visible within that triangle shape more or less froze like a, a screenshot and then that section of the sky was moving with the triangle while the rest of the sky around it was stationary. The best way I can think to describe it would be like in the movie Predator and his active camo invisibility tech. The world behind him was visible but sort of skewed and this triangle passed over the sky for a few short minutes until it just seemed to either rise rapidly and disappear or shrink rapidly. It was about that time that we noticed that it had also gone eerily silent outside with us. No crickets or anything. Even the wind seemed to have stopped. We decided to go in for the night after that as we were both pretty weirded out by it. In awe, of course, but also weirded out. I got some good pictures of the night sky, but of course, as is usual, they didn't see anything weird. Anyway, a few hours later, the same evening when we were getting ready for bed, I wanted to try a long exposure setting that I had found on my GoPro, so I was standing on the porch taking pictures. That is when I heard the whistle. Now, I'm not an overly superstitious man by any means, but I've heard stories and not wanting to take my chances, I didn't return the whistle. There was a second whistle shortly after, the first that expedited my decision to just go back inside. We ended out, we just sort of laughed it off in the end and made sure the doors were locked and we went to bed. Mind you, due to the lack of air conditioning in this house, the windows were all open for airflow. An hour or so later after we were asleep, my wife wakes me up to ask if I hear something. It was at this point that we both hear very clearly a deep growl and breathing like that of a bear or a large animal outside of our window on the porch. Not loud, but definitely very bassy we could hear heavy footsteps on the porch as well. We woke our friends up and quickly turned all the lights on to look around. There were no footprints on the dusty porch and none in the soft mud around the porch, so this experience we really just cannot explain. Of course, our friends were asleep in their room and they didn't hear a thing and they didn't experience the earlier sighting outside either. Nothing else weird happened while we stayed there for the rest of that trip though. But the final thing to have happened, and this is the part that really weirded my wife out, was that a month or so later when we were back home, we were in the kitchen making dinner when she looked up and there was an owl sitting on the fence just sort of staring into the house at us. I wasn't at that time aware of the correlation between alien sightings and abductions and the sighting of owls, but... I definitely am now. To our knowledge, we didn't have any lost time events or anything like that, but it just kind of felt like we saw something that we weren't supposed to see, and maybe they were checking us out to see if we were cool. For my wife, this is all a little bit too much, and it has made her very uneasy to stare at the stars as much anymore. I, on the other hand, am still very much intrigued, we haven't noticed any more owls as of late, so who knows if it was just a coincidence or not. But I'm sharing this because I want to describe my experience and just explain it to someone out there. I would also be interested in hearing if anyone else has experienced, well, 
anything like this. I went camping with my wife and stepdaughter the other night near Laguna Mountain in California. We were off the main road in a secluded route that seldom had cars passing by. No foot traffic through the area at all, however. And we heard a noise late during the night that honestly could be explained logically by something natural, I guess. Something we just don't know about. However, my wife and I have both been losing sanity trying to understand what that noise could have been or what could have made the noise. The first occurrence of the noise occurred around midnight and we can only describe it as a slow, deliberate, rhythmic nail scratching on the tensioned paracord strips that were securing the tent to the ground. Naturally, we thought that it might have been a critter curious about the tent but the slowness and the rhythm of the noise makes us believe otherwise, because critters like that generally scratch quickly and sounds more hasty, I guess. The other conclusion that leads us to believe that it wasn't a critter was because of the fact that throughout the night, we actually did hear squirrels running around outside, curious of all of our stuff that was outside. Why is that detail important? because during the time leading up to the noise and the time after the noise, we heard absolutely no critters outside running up to or away from the tent. Which means that whatever was creating the noise was absolutely silent coming up to and away from the tent, or eerily enough, may have actually been floating or something of that nature. We did hear it again at around 2 a.m. the same night, and during that specific episode, the noise seemed to have shifted from one corner of the tent to the corner closer to our heads, allowing us to even feel the vibration of the scratching reverberating throughout the floor of the tent. And that's what leads me to believe that it was the taut paracord strips because of the tension allowing the vibration to be much stronger. Now, we may have also heard the noise again a third time, but... It seemed so weak and went on for such a small duration compared to the other times that we honestly couldn't really key in on the noise that time. So we aren't sure if it was actually the same thing or just our sanity playing tricks on us at that point. My wife and I were very disturbed when we heard that though and it honestly kept us awake and on high alert for a long time. But we're very curious to know what it may have been as well and that's why I'm here. Has anyone had a similar experience or does anyone have an explanation as to what that could have been? I'm 23, female, and from the UK. From the ages of 9 to 11, I was best friends with this girl that we'll call Sarah. She and I formed a little group at primary school with two other girls. Their names were Lauren and Ellen, but we were each other's best friends first as we lived so close. Sarah lived one street over from me, so I would always sleep over at her house, but she never came over to my house as we were very, very poor and honestly I was embarrassed about the state of my house. The sleepovers became a bit of a weekly thing though and it was just her and her mum who worked every weekend, so we spent a lot of time in the house alone. She would show me her mum's explicit material from like the 80s that all included vampires. As a nine-year-old, I had no idea what was going on and I'd just sort of sit there blankly. She'd always say, doesn't it make you want to do it? And things like that. She would also get her mum's toys and show them to me and make me hold them, which never really seemed odd to me, I guess, until I got a bit older. But even at the time, I felt uncomfortable. I was a pretty nervous child and I struggled to make friends, so I'd often go along with whatever she said just because I felt lucky to have a friend, outside of school that is. But she would often make up scary stories or do sort of mildly creepy things at night like sing patty cake in a babyish voice close to my ear while I was sleeping or pretend her dolls were alive and wanted to punish me for taking her attention away from them, which creeped me out, but never outright concerned me, I guess. 
though my mum was worried that I was having constant nightmares at this point. None of this affected me though too much, and so I stayed friends with her. Later that year I got mauled by a dog, Japanese Akita, and had reconstructive surgery on my face. Due to this I had to take medication at certain times, and would be escorted to and from the school office every day by my other friend Lauren. Because of this, we became best friends and I started sleeping over at her house instead of Sarah's. Sarah didn't like that I was getting a lot of attention due to my fresh scar that I had, or that I had replaced her with another friend, so she said that I was pregnant at 10. Complete with tears and plans and everything, including Ellen telling her mum at the end, as kids we really didn't even question the validity of her claim. At some point she dropped this and next she pretended that she had cancer. I called her out on that one as I knew a lot about cancer because my auntie had it at the time which she really didn't like. After that she started calling me names, stealing my school stuff, made up lies about me and more, making our other two friends pick me or her. It fluctuated a lot, so sometimes they'd be my friends, other times they'd be hers. During this time, though, I slept over at Lauren's a lot, and a lot of my stuff went missing. A pink flip phone that I just got as my first phone ever. This was like 2010. And my DS Lite, which was my prized possession at the time. My mum, she got involved at this point and demanded that they find it as she knew that I'd taken it to the sleepover. In the end... Lauren supposedly found them both smashed up on a road far from either of us lived and returned them to me completely broken weeks later. Later on, Sarah and I got invited to swimming baths for Lauren's birthday and for once we got along like it was having my best friend back. Us kids were basically left alone in the pool to mess around for a few hours. An important note here too is that I really couldn't swim and I still can't I had chicken box during school swimming lessons and I'm terrified of water now, so I've just never learned since then. Anyway, at one point I was so sick of being stuck in the shallow end, like a baby at the age of 11, when all of my friends were swimming in the deep end, Sarah noticed this and came over to me. She offered to piggyback me and swim me to the deep end so I could play with everyone else. I was really happy to be included. I didn't even think about the fact that she didn't really regularly like me or that if she left me, I really couldn't swim back. I just hopped right on and she swam us out. She started mock tipping me sideways like she was going to drop me and I cried and begged her to take me back. I was terrified of getting water in my face or going underwater. Still can't go underwater to this day. She just laughed at me though and then dropped me, dunking me under the water and holding my head there where I struggled and I couldn't breathe. I remember struggling and being unable to breathe, but the next thing I knew a lifeguard had pulled me to the side of the pool and I was choking on air and shaking. I also have horrible reactions to the smell of chlorine and it makes me sneeze and my eyes swell up, so I had to be picked up, but everyone told me that it was an accident and just kids messing around. She later told me that it was just a joke. I should learn to swim and stop being a baby, which I guess is kind of true, but still, after that day, I didn't want to be around her anymore. Our friends still flip-flop between us, some days being her friend, other days being mine, but that was fine. I didn't care anymore and I was just sick of her. I avoided her like the plague at this point. And I mean, primary school was almost over and... After that, I never had to see her again. Eventually, we all went to secondary school, ages 11 to 16, and we all went to the same one, but my school was categorized into classes, the top being the smartest, and I, Lauren, and Ellen were all in the top class, and Sarah wasn't. It was a nice buffer, and I got my best friends back, as well as making more friends for the first time ever, and so I completely forgot about her, in all honesty. But then, one day as I walked home from school, I passed the corner shop on my way home and she was there, blocking the path, waiting for me it seemed. 
Her school tie was tied around her head like a headband and she was crying. I tried to go around her and she growled at me and launched herself at me. I was like 4'7", 80 pounds if that and she was much larger than me and I'd never been in a fight ever. I really had no idea what to do to get her off of me while she clawed at my neck and alternated kneeing me and elbowing me. I just wanted her off me. I grabbed the tire wrapped around her head and pulled her as hard as I could until she fell to the ground. And with that, she just ran away crying. I remember walking the rest of the way home so confused. I mean, what had I even done to her to deserve that? I mean, I hadn't even spoken to her in like eight months at that point, and she and our other friends were in the same tutor group, and they hadn't mentioned anything to me. Eventually, I forgot about that too. I turned 12 a couple of months later, and the day after my birthday, I walked into school having spent all of my birthday money on new pens that I was excited to show off. I was a bit of a weird kid, I know, but first lesson of the day begins, and Ellen runs up to me and says, Sarah's brought a knife to school. She showed me in Tudor and she said that she brought it for you. At first, I kind of laughed out loud at that, assuming that it was a joke of some kind since any sort of weapon brought to our school was grounds for immediate expulsion. And nobody was stupid enough to try that, especially at 12 years old. I think I even made a joke about it, probably being a butter knife. She repeated though that... Apparently she was serious, that she told the teachers about it and they'd actually called the police at this point. Again though, I just didn't believe her. To me it seemed crazy that they would call the police over a 12 year old bringing a knife to school. But they did. The police arrived minutes later and that was that. I never saw the knife but she was immediately expelled. I don't know for sure why me or what she had planned to do, but she must have told multiple people that she was going to do something to me because it was an ongoing joke the rest of the time that I was at school. She ended up going to the school my little sister had just started at, and she apparently also told my sister that it had been for me, but it was just a joke. Side note, my little sister is a year younger and is a fighter. And at this stage, I've still never been in a real fight and my sister has always fought anyone who badmouthed me. She's a real one for sure, but my sister apparently punched her for that and that was the last that I heard from her until I was like 18 years old. I turned 18 and I was at university and then out of the blue I was tagged in an old primary school photo by Sarah. It had the whole class in it, but she tagged only me. I found this a bit odd, but didn't do anything about it. And I mean, it was on my old Facebook account anyway, so I just ignored it. A couple of months later, though, it was Sarah's birthday, and she sent me a message asking if I would come to her birthday party. Mind you, I hadn't spoken to her in like six years at this point. And the last time I had, I mean, she'd fought me and then brought a knife to school. So in the end, I simply ignored the message and I just moved on with my life. Later I saw that she and Lauren had reconnected and were best friends again apparently, which always concerned me as Lauren and I had stayed friends for years and she knew everything about how Sarah had treated me. But I've never really put much thought into it, other than that it's likely that they were still friends the whole time and Lauren had stolen my DS and phone because of Sarah and they'd broken them together. But the last time that I saw her, I was 19 and I was on a date with my boyfriend walking down the street and I saw her standing at the bus stop. I wasn't really bothered since I'd neither seen or heard anything from her for years until our eyes met and she grinned and pulled out her phone and started filming me until I was out of sight. Now, I have no idea why she did any of the things that she did and I mostly feel sorry for her based on the way her life has turned out so far. But really, I still hope that I never, ever run into her again. Recently, there was an amber alert, and my daughter was asking me what that beeping sound was all about. 
for those who don't know, an Amber Alert goes out when a child is reported missing. If you receive notifications, you know what I'm talking about. The alert will sometimes give information like the victim's appearance as well as the perpetrator, the location of the abduction, make and model of a vehicle, stuff like this. Anyway, my phone started beeping one evening while helping my daughter clean her room, an Amber Alert. She asked about it. I gave her a small rundown and that was that. However, it triggered a childhood memory that I have where I believe with all of my heart that I was almost kidnapped when I was a kid. To be clear, this isn't a memory that was laying dormant in my subconscious or anything, and this random amber alert and talk with my kid caused it to resurface in my mind. This incident is something that I've pondered and thought about off and on for years now. I'm a 41-year-old male, by the way. So, it's been a while since I've considered the factors and details of the experience, and this recent Amber Alert and talk with my daughter really caused me to pause and reflect on the incident itself once again. And so, here I am. As a parent, you worry about these things and you do all you can to protect your children, especially when you personally experience something truly scary just like this. Now, the occurrence happened when I was just a young kid. My guess is around seven or eight. I can't be sure, but... I think that that's a safe estimate based on the fact that much of these early childhood memories aren't really there anymore. I do remember my kindergarten experience, which I would have been five or six, and also later grades as well, but this incident must have happened sometime after or maybe even around the ages of seven to eight. My parents took me to a neighboring city to do some shopping one day. We lived in a small rural town with not much on offer, so... From time to time, we would go to this neighboring city, about 45 minutes from where we were located. It just had more to offer, I guess, and they would take me up there for school clothes shopping, out to eat because restaurants were better, and because my mum was a bit of a crafter. She loved to make crafts, it was her thing. There were these different craft stores and a fabric store that she liked going up to there as well. Now, on this specific trip, we went to a fabric store up there, Joanne Fabrics to be exact. This was a pretty big store. As a little kid, I guess most every place seems big, but no kidding, this was actually a pretty sizable place. My dad, he sat out in the car while I went in with my mum. He did that a lot growing up. He would just sit in the car when there was a store that he didn't want to go into, so I really can't blame him there. I can't recall exactly what all my mum was looking for or trying to get in that store that day, but I do remember what section we were in, an area with a bunch of racks with various fabrics hanging. Imagine a clothing store with circular racks with clothes hanging around them, and that's pretty much what it's like at this fabric store, racks of hanging fabrics. I remember this area being sort of slightly toward the beginning or entrance of the store, as my mum was looking through these racks, I sort of begin to wander around. Not far though, just enough to kind of look around myself. I was probably bored and started wandering around, is my guess, but I could still see my mum just up and over a few racks away, so it wasn't like I was on the other side of the store or anything. Anyway, a random man approached me, and honestly, I can't even remember at what direction he came from. It's just like I was there by myself one minute and the next I looked up and saw this guy. It was like he came in fast and sort of out of nowhere. But I quickly looked over to where my mum was. She had moved a few racks up and away but I could still see her. There was a fair bit of distance between my mum and me at this point. And so here I am standing behind some rack of fabric with this older guy opposite me on the other side of this rack. Then, he speaks. Hey little boy, how you doing there? I remained silent because this took me completely off guard. He asked, where's your folks at? Are you alone in here? I stood still and sort of quiet. Come here, I got something to show you. At this point, he started advancing toward me, coming around the rack to where I was. 
I quickly started the other way, but he stopped and started coming around the other way as if to meet me in the middle. I was scared at this moment and became instantly aware that this man seemed a bit dangerous and like he was trying to get a hold of me. Come here, he barked. I, I jerked fast to the left, but he did the same. And at that point, he had this real wild look in his eyes. Whichever direction I went, he followed, but remember, there's a rack between us. Honestly as well, I I'm so thankful for that rack. After some back and forth movements from me and this man, I finally lock on with my mum and yell, Mum, help! You would have thought that I had screamed bloody murder. It was so loud, but it got my mum's attention and did the job. What's wrong, she asked. This startled the man and he looked over his shoulder in the direction of my gaze and confirmed that yes, that must be his mother. His demeanor all of a sudden completely changes and it's as if everything is just fun and games and he was just messing around and he said as much to my mum. I was just messing around with him. No harm, ma'am. My mum came to where I was and as we reconnected, the guy just sort of tips his hat at my mum and makes his way out of the store. I explained to my mum what had just happened, that this guy was trying to get me. I was so upset and really shook up. She told me that I did the right thing by yelling and getting her attention. It was terrifying for sure though and I'm thankful that something crazy didn't happen. Could I have been imagining things like maybe this guy was really just messing around? I seriously doubt it. I very much think that there were nefarious intentions. I mean, why would a random older guy be perusing a fabric store? If he was there for something like crafts or fabrics, why promptly leave when confronted? To this day, I, I truly believe that he was up to no good. This all happened about 10 years ago. I had just graduated high school and was living with my grandmother at the time. At this time, I had no idea what sleep paralysis even was, nor had I heard of any of these types of experiences. I've never done any drugs other than smoking a bit of weed every now and then, maybe two or three times a year earlier, but I've never had any problems with anything. Now one night, right before falling asleep, in a spare bedroom with all the lights off and the door closed, I felt an extremely weird and unsettling feeling in my body. My body all of a sudden felt extremely heavy and seemed sort of fuzzy. I'm really not sure how else to describe it, but I thought that I had fallen asleep and sort of woke up, only this time I couldn't move at all. As I said before, at this point in time, I had never even heard of sleep paralysis. During this experience, though, I seriously thought that I was dying. I assumed I was having a heart attack or something, and something was seriously wrong. Panic set in, and I began panting and trying as hard as I could to move and get up, with no success, obviously. Next thing I know, a completely black silhouette of a person moved into the room from the door. It was pitch black, like as if a person was wearing a bodysuit of Vanta Black. The only thing that was not completely black was its head, which appeared to be sort of black-white film static, like from an old TV. It entered the room, stood at the foot of the bed for some time, before I was able to move, and then it just suddenly disappeared. I immediately grabbed my cell phone and punched in what I had experienced in hopes of figuring out what the heck had just happened to me. This is when I learned about sleep paralysis and the shadow people that people see and experience. After that incident, I began having trouble sleeping, as I was extremely fearful of experiencing it again. I really cannot remember how much later, although all of these experiences happened within about a year's time, but eventually, it happened again. This time, I was visiting my siblings, living with my mother. I was in a bedroom with my younger brother, who was playing a PlayStation. 
There was a queen bed in the room that I was laying in and a twin mattress on the floor beside it that my brother was sitting on. Some time had passed before the last sleep paralysis experience that I had, but right before falling asleep, I felt that familiar feeling of heaviness. I tried to get up, but it was too late. I couldn't move, but again, I could see the room. I assume my eyes were open, but I guess I really have no idea. But I could see my brother still sitting on the mattress toward my feet. I tried as hard as I could to yell his name, to get him to shake me in an attempt to get me out of this sleep paralysis. But this, this didn't work at all. With a view of the bedroom door, one after another, four pitch black shadow figures entered the room. This time, they were pitch black head to toe, no static face. They slowly gather around the bed that I was in, likely within arm's reach. They stood there for some time as I was experiencing, even to this day, the most horrifying experience that I have ever had. I mean pure terror. Then they all spoke. When they did, it was like a booming omniscient voice that didn't seem to come from them specifically but just emanated from all around me. The only words that they spoke were, the scene cannot be unseen. They then disappeared and I awoke more terrified than I have ever been. Now, I've never really told this story before and there were a couple of more experiences, I guess you could say, of sleep paralysis that I have experienced, but I did not see anything during those. Nothing like this, at least. I'm really hoping that it doesn't happen again, but quite honestly, uh, I'm pretty fearful that it will. If you guys have any advice as to what I should do about any of this, or what this might be exactly, then please feel free to let me know, because I would genuinely appreciate the interaction. I lost my father in 2021. He passed away at the age of 56. He worked in a factory where they made paint. Due to his field, he developed scar tissue in his lungs. He had pulmonary fibrosis. He fought for five years, but during COVID, he got bronchitis and he passed away. Shortly after his passing, I dreamed of my dad one more time prior to this time and he was laying on his bed smiling with a thumbs up. When he appeared to me, he didn't say anything and it was more like a feeling that I knew that it was him. He looked really young though and he glowed, not in a movie or cartoon way but in a sort of out of this world kind of way. I ended up crying in my sleep and my mum woke me up. I was apparently sobbing. After that time, I dreamed of him again about a year later, but this time it was different. I remember that I was in my living room and my dad had his Lazy Boy recliner in the corner of the living room. That recliner was honestly his sanctuary. He spent most of his time in that chair and I can remember seeing my dad rocking in his chair with his oxygen tank right next to him. Because of his pulmonary fibrosis, he has a very distinct cough as well. In my dream, my dad was weak and sick. He was rocking back and forth and coughing. As I got closer, his cough got more exaggerated until it eventually turned into this evil, loud sort of laugh. I also remember saying, you're not my dad and trying to wake up. Then I realized that I was sort of stuck I had sleep paralysis. When my mum was laying next to me, it was really hard on her losing my dad, so for the first year I moved in with her and slept with her because she hadn't slept alone in like over 30 years. But it was at this point that my mother apparently felt someone get on the bed, but obviously there was nothing there, so out of fear she actually woke me up. Obviously, neither of us had spoken to each other, so... This is weirdly coincidental. When she did wake me up though, she was absolutely terrified. And she said that she felt and saw the imprint of something climbing onto the bed.
A while back, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, around 2009 maybe, when I was just a child, my family went to the Dominican Republic for a spring break and we stayed in Santo Domingo. It was an amazing trip, don't get me wrong, but I only really recall a single memory from the whole vacation. I walked into my parents' room in the rental house, which was just beside the indoor balcony, to get a swimsuit to change into. As I was walking out, I distinctly remember a creature of some sort crossed the gap between the double doors, only visible for about a second, and me being so young, decided to run back to my parents instead of chasing it. Neither of them saw it. Now, I recall it even more strongly though because I drew it multiple times afterwards as a kid. I remember it being three to four feet tall, white with short hair all over. It had human arms and hands and feet, but a head with a protruding mouth and nose. Strangest of all, its legs went backwards in a similar way to most animals, despite it walking on its two hind legs. I've never heard a similar story to this anywhere, so I am wondering if someone can help me. It's been in the back of my mind for at least a decade now, and I would really like to figure out what this might be. So I'm 17, and this encounter happened all the way back when COVID just started. I stayed at my grandparents' mansion at the time because my mother was working abroad. I stayed there for like six months and I felt uncomfortable and paranoid every day that I was in there. At November 13th, my grandma went outside to buy some groceries while my grandpa went to the other house to drink with his other friends. That's what Filipinos do. So being the child that I was, I decided to explore the mansion a bit. While I saw some stuff that was unnerving and kind of creepy, I didn't find them as creepy as what I saw upstairs. You see, my grandparents always had a thing for dolls. When I saw the shadow of a little girl around the corner though, at first I thought that I was just seeing a big doll, but when I got around there, I obviously didn't. Instead, I saw the shadow of something, but... I didn't see the shadow being connected to anything. What I mean is that there was just this shadow there. The shadows occur because something shines on them or something like that, right? But I didn't see anything casting a shadow, just there was a, a shadow there. At this, I became pretty scared and I immediately went back downstairs. But that, that wasn't the last time that I saw it. You see, on the same month in the middle of the night, I needed to go to the bathroom. The room that I was staying in was quite far away from the bathroom, so I had to walk for like two minutes or so, and because I was paranoid, I grabbed my phone and opened the flashlight. I got to the bathroom normally, and when I got out, and as I was making my way back to my room, I saw that same shadow again, but it wasn't the same shadow this time. This one looked like a little boy shadow. This time I just stayed still and I looked at it while my phone's flashlight went off because my phone was getting hot. And unfortunately, even after thinking about this encounter for so long, I really just cannot remember what happened after that. Maybe it was because it was just such a, a long time ago, but really, it's just black after that. I did tell my grandma about this, but... She didn't believe me and just sort of laughed it off. I know that this sounds kind of like a generic thing because it happened when I was so young and all these sorts of stories do, but I just can never forget the terror that I felt when I saw those shadows. And I would really like to remember exactly what happened that night. So... If some of you guys listen to all of the stories here, then you'll know that someone has been watching my place for some time now. This is a bit of an ongoing drama and I honestly wish that I wasn't sharing this right now. 
I've had weeks of peace with only the ping of my overactive camera system alerting me to people passing by with their dogs or children. Honestly, I, I thought everything was fine and maybe this isn't the most dramatic update, but it was just another scary tick mark to add to the list. So, I got an alert to activity outside the garage. Given my garage door crowbar banger, that's the one that I always pay most attention to, honestly. I keep weird hours and I hadn't been on my phone, so at first I thought my dad was leaving for work. But then I saw the recording it made instants later. This man walked boldly up to the car in the driveway, my mum's at the moment, and tried the handles of the doors before running off. I called the police with a good description and told them that I have video about it, but my town doesn't have a large police force and some of them are just like any department, I guess, shady and a bit lazy. I've rewatched it so many times now and he has the same build as the man that I saw at the garage before. That's obviously not definitive, but now I have more details about his description that I couldn't see before due to the lack of lighting and cameras and all that. I'm still pretty shaken up about this, even though he didn't try to get in or anything. I was outside not even half an hour ago, though in the fenced backyard portion. This just feels all wrong to me too because, well, nothing is solved. And even though it might be unrelated, is that actually probable? That one person and or their house would attract so much trouble from completely different individuals? It doesn't seem likely, right? Also, just to add some information, this man saw the camera before he ran. I don't know if he would have tried more, had he not, but it has like a little red and blue light on the front part that rotates a full circle. It's large and lights up a bit. That's why I thought that they deterred the creep so far. And we were eventually visited by the police who very kindly didn't ring the bell. Parents asleep have been texted all about this, but I gave all the evidence and they actually found the guy. I don't know if we're absolutely sure it was the same man that banged on my garage or watched from the window, but I do know that they caught this guy. And my video footage will be used in court, I guess. I don't know. Quite honestly, I was really doubtful that they'd actually send someone due to the chastising text message. Non-emergency was closed and all that, so I called the regular line. As I mentioned earlier in some other videos about this incident, my dad had told me that there had been a lot of car thefts in the neighborhood. But the weirdest part to me that I think I must be imagining or something is that he looks, from the somewhat fuzzy camera stills, quite a bit like the guy that I had a one night stand with a couple of months ago, right around when all of this started. I really didn't think that it could be him, but I'm hoping that since I'm supposed to get the ring footage to the officer tomorrow, I don't have access to that one right now, I can ask who this person actually is. I'm really hoping that it's all over now, all of this has given me a lot of comfort. And unless I'm wrong and there's a second person, which is pretty unlikely, this should be my last update on, thankfully, a closed chapter. I would really like your opinions on this situation and what you think could be done. So, to begin, no one lives there now. We just come there from time to time. This house was built in the 1800s and since it's been renovated, it's still in place like it was originally built but it looks a bit different. It's from my husband and his brother and they got it from their grandmother. Grandmother and her husband got it from an old lady that lived there. They made a deal with her to take care of her and in return they would inherit a house. Everyone in the village always said that that lady was apparently a witch the lady passed away and they got the house and after granddad died grandma lived there alone grandpa died in his 60s and grandma died when she was 99 years old she always said though that there must be something in the house that's not from this world she would always hear weird noises she invited priests for blessings and hoped that it would cleanse the house but nothing ever really seemed to help now 
My husband and his brother, they have some crazy stories from that house. When they went to sleep, they heard steps and Alexa would go off many times with loud music. Their rooms have one wall that they share and my husband saw black shadows in the hallway often. His dog one time jumped from the bed, started barking at the door and was in a lot of distress. She was shaking with fear and then the door of the closet opened and she just wouldn't come out of there. His brother, whenever he was there alone, when he goes to sleep, feels like something is always choking him. There were a lot of weird things like that. One time when they renovated, they decided to move some bricks that were in the garden for some 40 years or so ago and they found bones beneath them. The dog took one of them and chewed on it until my husband could take it away from her. And she died three months after that from intestinal perforation. Coincidence maybe? I don't know, but it's a bit weird. There's a lot of other things, but I think you get the picture and I'm wondering what we could do about this. Is the house cursed or haunted or, I don't know, is there something in there? Demonic? And if there is, well, what can we do about it? This happened to me back in 2008 to early 2010s. When I was 11, I met a girl who was the same age as me, 6th grade. She and I weren't in the same class until high school, but we were in the same school, so we saw each other often. By the middle of the sixth grade, things got a little bit creepy. Somehow, she was everywhere every time I had an extra class, including every time that I had to switch from another schedule to another one. My entire life, I never gave her my private information, but somehow she just knew. Unfortunately, I had reported it to the teacher or faculty members, but they brushed it off by warning as a ruse because I didn't have enough evidence to prove that it was actually her. What's worse, we weren't allowed to give any electronic device sort of information, like phones for example, for pieces of evidence against her, except calculators for maths and physics or whatever. Weird, right? Anyway, this bothered me for a long time. She even shared the same home economics class and swimming lessons as mine during the 8th grade, but yet again not the same group. Even in ninth grade, she still kept following me non-stop, despite me warning her to leave me alone. After I graduated, I left for high school to start over, and even though I forgot about her until the middle of like October of 2012, she was back again. My skin honestly turned pale and my heart began to race when I saw her. I was in a panic. I mean, this girl... How did she even know that I was in the high school that I was in? I mean, again, I didn't leak my information anywhere, and certainly not to her. Once again, she wouldn't leave me alone, though. And this is where things start to get a bit worse. You see, she guilt-tripped me into befriending her to let her use my belongings without my permission. And despite her softer manner, it was definitely a red flag to begin with that I should have avoided sooner. Another time, she overheard me and my classmate having a conversation about my wanting a key charm that my classmate had. The next day, she attacked me after I took a seat in the class because she knew that I wanted something that she didn't. Again, really strange behavior, but this incident caught the attention of the principal this time in my high school, and the principal recapped the whole situation by writing a statement report. I ended up having to rewrite the whole thing twice because of grammar errors and all that. And by the third, the principal had made a decision. She was suspended for a week, but that didn't do much. She returned after a week and accused me of her suspending, which honestly I wasn't even involved with in her drama and all that. I mean, I didn't have any other choice but to report my statement. Once again, too, she guilt-tripped me for other reasons by hypocritically calling me for being a terrible friend, and she even went as far as to destroy some of my belongings and supplies. I called her out on that, but she pretended that she didn't remember it. 
worse too. She framed a student for having a torn notebook that she destroyed and yet she refused to admit her mistakes. That was my last straw as it honestly made my blood boil a bit. But I didn't want to show my anger as she gave me a watch in exchange for money. Which turns out she swindled it and got away with it. But in all of these situations, half of my peers and teachers witnessed these incidents and warned me that I should end my friendship with her. That she wasn't my friend, just saw me as a pawn and manipulated me by taking advantage of my kindness and trust. We were still in the same high school, mind you, but I sort of quietly, outright, not to be close with her again, started distancing myself. That is, until early December of 2012, because that was the last time that I saw her, and I guess that she was expelled after the last warning from one of my peers. I felt relieved, but I'll never forget what she did to not only me, but to the other half of my peers as well. It took me nearly to the end of high school to really realize that she was indeed not a very good friend, and her attitude was sort of sociopathic and very creepy as well. That was, in the end, the reason why I ended things with her for good as well. Luckily, I didn't give her my phone number or address or anything, since that wasn't allowed in the school and we had moved by this point. I managed to avoid that red flag, I guess, which I am very grateful for. It's been some time since this incident took place. After I finished my high schooling in 2015, I'm almost 27 and currently have a job. And this experience has definitely made it difficult to trust someone or befriend them again. It was a weird time for me and last I heard, she was in trouble with the law and... Yeah, again, definitely a red flag that I managed to dodge. A lot of uh, weird things have been happening around my place, but almost every incident is possibly explained by something normal, I guess. Like my bedroom door closing gently on its own, but my window was open, so it could have been that, I suppose even though there was no wind blowing that night. But every situation is sort of like this. Like, for instance, I hear floorboards squeaking on my stairs when no one is upstairs or anywhere near there, but it is an old house and noises happen, right? I often hear or feel someone walking into the room while my back is turned. I look back fully expecting to see my son or my husband trying to sneak up on me and startle me, but... There's no one there. I also have had the sensation of someone gently grabbing me when nobody is around. That's been happening since, like, I was a kid. I'm currently in my late 30s. But there's some things that have also completely freaked me out. I was standing in the hallway talking to my son one day, and I noticed this shadow on the wall above the doorway next to us. I assumed it was caused from the sunlight coming in through the bathroom window behind him. The shadow was moving like my son was while talking to me. But then he walked away and, unbelievably, the shadow stayed there. At first I thought it was actually just my shadow, but I moved and the shadow stayed. It was still moving about like it was when my son was there, speaking to me. I tried putting my hands up in front of the window, you know, to block the sunlight, but... I couldn't get my actual shadow to reach that high up on the wall, no matter where I stood. The window is unusually high up on the wall. You definitely need a ladder to see into the bathroom from the outside. I actually recorded a video of the shadow to show my husband at the time too. I could have sworn that I saved it to my Google photos, but it's not there at the moment, so I have to look around for it. But the incident that freaked me out the most was when I was opening the bathroom door to exit the bathroom. The door suddenly swung open so hard that I honestly thought that my son was messing with me and that he grabbed the door from the outside and yanked it from my hand, swinging it wide open. I looked immediately through the small opening on the hinge side of the door to catch him in the act of trying to scare me, yelling, nice try. But when I did... And when I went out there and looked around, nobody was there. So, am I just being paranoid or 
Is there something going on here? So, I really don't know what's going on and I don't know who to talk to and I'm not necessarily rolling in dough to hire a psych or a doctor or something. I guess I just want some advice. I don't know if I'm going crazy. I want to know if anything like this has happened to anyone else because I just don't want to feel alone anymore. So here's what happened. I was sleeping and I think I got sort of stuck in between sleeping and awake. I genuinely thought that I was awake and I tried to get up but all of a sudden I just couldn't move. Now I've had sleep paralysis before but this time was completely different. I was 100% conscious and lucid and at first I wasn't really scared I guess I just sort of laid there. I remember just thinking how long is this going to be like this for and so after a few minutes I tried to get up again and I realized that I can actually move my arms, all of my body parts, but sort of not at the same time. Imagine like a phantom sort of limb syndrome, but the difference here is that I don't have any missing limbs. This is going to sound weird, I know, but I could have sworn that I could move everything, but my real body wasn't moving at all. And the strangest thing out of all of this experience is that I could see my hands when I moved them while my real arms and hands remained sort of motionless next to my body. So I'm literally waving my arms around and I could see them but they were sort of transparent. And so at this point I begin to panic thinking that I'm actually dead or something. My knees were up in the air and my feet were on the bed with the rest of my body with the blanket on me from the waist down. I had my iPad with a case that had a stand on it placed on my stomach when I originally fell asleep. I grabbed my iPad and put it next to me. I felt the case close together in the back of it and heard it close even and saw it but it sort of felt lighter and was like I took the soul out of my iPad because it was also transparent when I grabbed it. I did that two more times and my real iPad remained on my stomach only when I moved my hands and arms I could see them and when I stopped they were sort of invisible completely. Anyway, so I'm laying there for like 10 minutes and I started to get bored I guess and wanted to move my hands around again and watch what was happening. I started to touch my face and it felt sort of squishy and just weird the next thing I did was I interlocked my fingers like in a cartoon where someone would sort of crackle their fingers. And the second that I did that, something big crawled from my right shoulder onto my body and bit onto my hand. Weirdly though, it didn't hurt, like bad, but I felt it. It felt like needle teeth, like a, a cat maybe, and it stayed on me, biting into me. When it ran across my body is when I could see it. And whatever it was, it was humanoid but moved like a primate. It had long, very skinny arms and ran like a monkey, like with its knees next to its shoulders. This was a matter of seconds, mind you, so when it bit down, it felt like maybe 19 seconds or so, which is long because I couldn't move my head and I could only move my arms and they were only my spirit arms or whatever. Again, I want to remind everyone that this wasn't a dream. I was 100% conscious and lucid. I couldn't move my physical body, obviously, but I was thinking and looking around for like 15 to 20 minutes before this happened. For some reason, I have no idea why I did this, but I reached with my other hand and I grabbed the back of, well, whatever this thing is, its head, and it felt like short hair like a pit bull almost, like the scruff of the back of a dog's neck or head. And I saw it look at me at this point, and it had dark holes where its eyes should have been. I don't know if there were eyes there or not, because it was only for a split second that I saw it, because I think out of shock I, I just let go, and I watched it run behind my legs, and then it peeked around my legs and looked at me. Then when it stopped moving... 
It disappeared because when it moved I could see it, like my arms. After that though, I must have broken out of whatever this was because all of a sudden I could move again and everything felt normal. Weirdly though, I could still feel the bite on my hand for like 15 minutes, the sort of pain and pressure of it. Honestly, I just sat there and I was like, what the heck just happened? I still have no idea what any of that was. It's never happened to me again and it's never happened to me before that either. It was completely random and out of the blue and I don't know if I'm going crazy like I said, if I need to see a psych or a doctor or something, but whatever it was, it happened and it's really freaking me out. My mother and I are very much into the paranormal and have been for a very long time. Before my son was born, in fact, the two of us would go on paranormal investigations together alongside of some professionals. We also enjoyed watching all of the paranormal programs on television, including the reenactments, documentaries, and investigation programs or shows. Anyway, one night, just like most evenings, my mother and I were sat on the couch watching Paranormal Hotel. While we were watching this, there was a comment made by one of the paranormal experts that they comment on stories and they explained why you should never mess around with Ouija boards, demons or something along those lines. I turned to my mum with that and said, I wouldn't mess with them, would you? And jokingly and pretty foolishly, she looked at me and said, oh yeah, I would. I knew that she was joking, but I quickly warned her not to joke like that, as it could be seen as taunting by any spirits or entities, despite us never experiencing anything in our home, or having any reason to think our home could be haunted. With all that I knew and had researched, I just wanted to be cautious, I guess. I then proceeded to tell her how spirits or entities can use electricity to come through to our realm. My mum looked at me and she shook her head saying that she didn't believe that that was possible, but I told her again not to speak like that. Now, here is where things get a little bit scary. Not even one minute later, as we sat there watching the TV, my upper left arm began to burn and it was like nothing that I'd ever felt before. I knew in that moment that this was not normal and so with that, I looked at my mum and told her that my arm was burning and that I thought that I'd been scratched. I pulled up the sleeve to my t-shirt and lo and behold, a large red scratch was appearing against my skin, becoming darker as we watched it. However, this scratch was in the shape of a large Z, like a perfect Z. Myself and my mother were pretty frightened by this. My partner was in the home at the time and... I instantly went into the room that he was in and showed him my arm and he was also in a little bit of shock by that. As well as being really frightened to the point that I was shaking, I was also angry that something had entered our home and caused me harm like this, especially when I wasn't the one who made the joke. I called out to who or whatever was with us, telling it that it was not welcome in our home, that it had no right to harm me and that it had to leave my mum also apologizing for her joke and then we turned the television off after this incident i have never been harmed by anything unseen again it was honestly a really weird and terrifying thing that i've experienced i have no idea how it got into our home or if it still lingers or if it took my words and left i also want to stress that the z that appeared on my skin it came out of absolutely nowhere. Like, there is no logical explanation as to how this happened. I was just sitting there and one moment it wasn't there and the next it was there. Mind you too, it was pretty deep and, like I said, it was in the shape of a perfect Z. In other words, there's just no way that I or anyone else in the home caused this. I did want to know though if anyone else here has experienced anything similar. Does anyone have any idea of what or who may have scratched me? Does the Z that was scratched onto my skin have any significance? 
like I said, but there was no way that I could have scratched myself. I was sat with my hands down by my sides watching TV. Nobody was near me and the shoulder that received the scratch was on the side of the couch by the wall. So, it is honestly just completely unexplainable. That is, if you discount the paranormal. I'm 29 years old and a quadriplegic wheelchair bound due to an accident when I was 14, leaving me paralyzed with no feeling or movement below my nipples. After years of consideration, to make my life easier and more stress-free, I decided to get a colostomy. It made the most sense for me to do it to make ease of life. For this surgery, I would need to do a 48-hour fast before my colonoscopy and then the next day, I would have my colostomy and could still not have any food up until the surgery. Which means that I roughly went four days without eating. Now, besides my surgery getting pushed back three hours, the surgery itself went well, and I awoke and was conscious, and everything went as planned. I would need to be hospitalized that evening, and the next day as well, and possibly a third, depending on how the nurses felt. That night, as my day winded down and my visitors would leave, I would spend the evening watching TV on my phone until I just got tired enough to try and fall asleep. I cannot feel that part of my body, so I wasn't in any pain or anything, but they were giving me small doses of pain medicine, just to keep me comfortable and help me to get some sleep. My room was dark with just the lights from my IV machine and the crack of the blinds from my window illuminating the room from the parking lot streetlights from the hospital. I would have some trouble sleeping that night, mostly feeling like I would sleep 5 or 10 minutes and then suddenly just awaken, but then would quickly fall back asleep just for the same process to happen again and again. This would go on until about 3 in the morning. I would eventually fall asleep once again, but... Then suddenly I awoke, but this time it felt like I was awakened for a purpose. Or maybe a better way to describe this is that I felt like I was being watched. When I awoke up laying in my hospital bed, something out of my right peripheral caught my attention. I would turn my head to the right and see a very tall, at least 10 foot tall, silhouette sitting in the hospital chair next to my window. Sitting down, this figure was so tall his head was almost to the ceiling. I would close my eyes and reopen them, as if to make my vision clear, as I didn't know what I was looking at. After doing that, the tall figure was still sitting there, and it seemed like he was looking at me, although he had no discernible eyes or facial features. Oddly enough, I was not scared, I guess, nor did I feel uncomfortable, in fact, almost quite the opposite, as it almost seemed like it was there to comfort me. I would look at the figure and say hello in the fraction of a second, almost as if I missed him making a move. He was suddenly standing at the side of my bed, towering over me, looking down. It's at this point where there must be some time missing or something, because the next thing I know, I'm laying flat on my back, still, but in a room that is completely white with no walls, no source of light, but very well illuminated. I seem to be laying on a piece of hard rock similar to granite. When I look up, there are now two black figures, both the same size with the same body structure. What was really weird, though, was that I felt I knew which one had taken me to this new place, and what one I had not had any confrontation with yet. At this point, I'm still pretty calm and not scared or feeling any harm will be done to me or anything. As I'm lying there, I turn to the first figure and ask him, is everything okay? To which he will reply a simple yes, followed by the second figure saying to me, we are just mending you. Then the first figure would pull a silver dome with a sort of bright shining light beaming down over the top of my head. This is where I have my second lapse in time, until this dome is pulled away from my face that is. Once I awaken I turn to the first figure who I felt that I had a better connection with, or possibly just felt like that's who I should be speaking to. I asked him what was the purpose of this. 
He doesn't answer, but the second figure turns towards me and says, It's that you have a new purpose. This is where my third lapse of time happens, and I'm floating through the foggy air from outside through my hospital window back into my bed. Almost as soon as I'm back in my bed, I was asleep. I would then sleep until 8.30 in the morning, and immediately when I woke up, this is the first thing that I thought about. And it felt so real, nothing like any dream that I've ever had, and I can recall every part of this experience, apart from the time lapses, obviously. Immediately, I would Google the definition of mending, a word which I would most likely never use in my life. Obviously, it means repair, to return to health and heal, improve an unpleasant situation, things of this nature. After this, I would call my wife and tell her the story of what I called being abducted by shadow people. Both of us were really confused on what the meaning of this was, but we both feel that it was real and not a dream. I also don't believe that it was a hallucination based on the pain medicine that I was on, as it was such a, a low dose and it was nothing that should really cause anything like this. Plus, I remember everything so vividly. The figures, though, both of them were very tall, at least 10 feet, and both were pitch black with no human features, that I could distinguish at least, other than the shape of their body. I remember seeing no fingers or nose or any facial features for that matter. It was more or less just a, a huge shadow. I don't necessarily know if they talked back to me or if I heard their voice telepathically, mainly because there really was no mouth. As I stated before though, they didn't scare me or make me feel uncomfortable. In fact, it's almost like I was in a bliss of comfort when I was around them. For some reason though, I do feel like the second figure was in charge or the boss, mainly because he seemed to answer for the first figure certain questions and seemed like he was leading the process, I guess. As I stated before too, I never saw them walk towards me or necessarily move, other than turning their body, it almost seemed like the silver dome wasn't even pulled down over my head via an arm or anything. Both of their voices were very different though, but both also very monotone. Since having this experience, I have not seen the shadow figures anymore, but the memory is still very strong and vivid in my mind, almost as if I am never to forget it, in fact. At the time of sharing this, it's now been a little over two months since it happened, and my wife recommended that I share it here to see if anyone has any similar situations or would maybe be able to make light of what happened, in fact. I did tell my nurse later that day about my experience, and she just said that that's creepy and that most people don't hallucinate off of that pain medicine, especially at the dose that I was given. Overall, it wasn't a, a bad experience, I guess. In fact, I actually feel really good about it, even if it was a little bit creepy. And as I stated before, I was not scared or uncomfortable at any moment. So, any comments or input is very much appreciated. So, this is not my encounter, it's my friend Q's. Q lives in a suburban place. She told me what was happening crying on the phone one day. I was at work and she was not, so I kept texting her to ask why she was not there. She finally texted back telling me that something had woke her up in the middle of the night and she needed to call me about it. On call, Q told me what happened. Her mum was playing with her crystals like she normally does. Even Q thinks her mum is crazy, but then a few hours later, when Q was sitting on the couch, she heard banging from upstairs. She said that she went to go and check it out, but nobody was there. This obviously creeped her the heck out, so she ran back downstairs and found one of her siblings. When she went to bed, she fell asleep, but then she awoke to what she described as a shadow-looking thing. It apparently had no eyes or anything, but it felt like it was staring at her. She couldn't move out of fear, she said. Then she said that she closed her eyes and started praying and opened them to see that it was gone and she could move again. 
When she told me this, I told her that it was probably just paralysis or something to that effect, but she told me that she had many other encounters with it, and apparently she even had a name for it. Anyway, uh, a few days after the whole call, she came up to me and started venting about how she was so scared to go to sleep, and even scared to go in dark rooms. But one time she was trying to fall asleep, and then one of her sisters started screaming. Q got up and went to go and see what it was, and she said that she could feel something off in her sister's room, and said that she thought that she saw a glimpse of the shadow thing again. She asked what was wrong with her sister. Now, all of her siblings were in the room with her, and her sister told them all that she saw a shadow thing in her room. She said that she felt like it was staring at her. Q then went and asked her mum about this, and her mum confessed to recently bringing in a demonic spirit into their house. She said that she was playing with her crystals and said that she thought that she brought something from another dimension in. A few days after this incident, her mum and her siblings could feel something watching them and sometimes even touching them too. Like one time when Q was alone at home, she was watching TV, she was watching a horror film apparently, and right when the scary monster thing's face was about to be shown, her power went completely out. It was around noon when it happened and everything just went completely dark. She remembers passing out on the couch suddenly and seeing something right when she was about to fall out. She then awoke and found a really large scratch on her back. She was obviously scared and annoyed as well because, well, there was blood on the couch and she had to clean it up. She showed me it though and it goes to the bottom of her back to the side of her torso on her back. And quite honestly, upon hearing all of this, it scared the heck out of me. I'll try and update the situation with Q and I'll see if I can try and communicate with whatever this is. But can anyone let me know what Q should do? And can anyone tell me if Q's mum did bring something forth? We have tried a Ouija board and we talked to a few things. It really wasn't scary and Q took her fingers off for a second and we could hear a bang come from upstairs. We asked it a few questions like why are you here and what do you want? I'm now sharing this in the dark and I'm hearing things and I'll do a more detailed update at some point in the future but quite honestly I just want all this to end because I just have a really weird feeling that something is wrong. A few years ago now, I was in a relationship with a guy named James, male and 20, for about three years. In the beginning, he was wonderful too. He supported me during my chemotherapy, was kind and funny, a bit crazy but not in a creepy way. He helped me surviving through my sickness and I really wouldn't be alive without him right now. But the last year of our relationship, he changed. He wanted to try new experiences and began taking drugs. I didn't know that he was an addict until our breakup. He was totally different though. Jealous, a liar, sometimes really harsh with me and he cheated on me before our breakup too. To be honest, I really had pity for him. So after the breakup, I'd spent six months helping him. I was a student, he was always at my home in pain trying to fight his addiction and after a while of trying to tell him to stop after a month in an institute he started drugs again like three hours after leaving it's a sad story but it gets worse you see during our relationship i chose my university to be close to him so i sort of was a bit isolated no friends no family no one but one month after cutting the rope Something strange happened, and everything began with my cat. So one night, I went out to see a movie. On my way home, it started raining, and I remembered that I'd left my cat outside. My cat is beautiful and nice, but hates water, pretty much like every cat does, I guess. But I started running to get home early, and when I opened the door, my cat was on my sofa. At first, I thought, oh, what an idiot I am. The cat wasn't outside at all, but then I hugged him and my cat was completely wet. 
that felt very weird to me at the time. I mean, I was like, what the heck? And then I thought maybe my neighbors could have opened my door to let him in or something. So I just sort of forgot about it. One week later, I began to realize that some of my clothes were missing, particularly my underwear. I do have ADHD though, so I blame myself for losing my own clothes at this point. But then the same thing happened with my food and some plates as well. Like one of my favorite bowls disappeared. It was a student's apartment, so not big enough to lose that many things really, but again, I just sort of blame myself. I even called myself a magician at one point, joking about how I can make anything disappear without even trying. But I completely lost it when I came back from my parents' house and discovered my place totally changed. There was even the neighbor's mail on my table with mysterious headphones. My photos on the wall were upside down and a black umbrella was on my bed too. I didn't even own an umbrella at this point. It was honestly very scary seeing this. So I called my mum and then the police. Yes, always mum first, right? The officer was nice but told me that really there was nothing that they could do. Except taking my complaint, that is. I didn't know who was doing this to me and so there really wasn't much to go off of. My ex never had my keys and even when I said that I don't want to talk to him anymore, I stayed nice and so... I didn't think that anybody wanted to hurt me or was scared of me or anything. I mean, for what? Joking? Whatever the case, I slept with a knife for like two years after this. My neighbors started getting scared too because we had a common basement and someone was breaking the door during the night. We found supplies in it even, like a blanket and a plate, not mine by the way. I had chains on the inside of my door so... I felt secure when I was inside, but I was scared to leave and come back to see my stuff all missing again. A few weeks go by, and in the evening I had to go to the grocery store. It took me like 30 minutes to get there and back. When I came back home, there was a note on my bedroom's mirror. Nothing was written on it, just a, a smiley face and... Obviously, that absolutely freaked me out, and I left immediately. Again, I called the police, and they told me that I should just leave the note and forget about it. Mind you, I didn't even have those kind of little sticky yellow paper sort of leaflet things, so I don't see how they were not concerned by this. In any case, I stayed with my mum for a week, Spend all of my money on a camera and post for help on social media because I felt completely distraught. But after that, weirdly enough, there was just nothing. In the meantime though, James's sister came to talk to me, saying that one of my favorite jackets was at their parents' house. I remembered wearing this jacket after saying stop to James. So again, I've got ADHD and I might have just forgotten it but I didn't see James's parents for like eight months at this time, so I found that pretty difficult to believe. Also, I suspected my neighbor who had one of my keys and was feeding my cat when I wasn't home, but she was in another country during most of this story, so that just didn't add up either. I talked with James last year about that, and he swore that he'd never done anything that weird and told me that he was in another rehabilitation center when all of this was happening. Everything stopped after that, and I still don't know who did this or why. Maybe it was my ex, maybe someone else, but I don't really care. I'm just glad that it stopped and I don't have to deal with this anymore. And he is hoping that that was the last of it. So I was at my grandma's house one time. I was around four years old at this point. It was right after Halloween and I say this because I remember the tiger costume that I wore that year. But anyway, I'm sitting on my grandma's lap just eating some candy and watching TV with her when I happen to turn my head back and see someone moving from one of the bedrooms to the bathroom across the hallway. It happened fast and the figure was all black but not like a shadow. It was a, a solid cloaked looking figure. 
At first, I really didn't know what to think. I just kept watching. I thought maybe it was my cousin, Easy, playing a prank on me because he liked to scare me a lot back then. But Easy wasn't there that weekend. He was supposed to be at a friend's house and it was just me and my grandma until my grandpa got off work later. So I sat there watching. And after a little bit of time went by, I remember seeing the figure sort of poke its head out from the bathroom and wave at me. There was no face to it though. It was like it was wearing a black veil and a hood over its head. It disappeared back into the bathroom before doing it again, popping out and waving at me. This time, I alerted my grandma and told her that there was someone in the bathroom. I was scared because I didn't know or understand who this could have been, but I know what I saw. My grandma gets up and walks down the hall to the bathroom. Mind you, no one ever exited the bathroom or I didn't see anything. And of course, after looking, there was no one there. I even followed her and looked myself, but there was no one. So we checked all three other bathrooms after that and there was no one in the house but us. I don't know what that was. I don't know where it came from, but this is something that has always stuck with me. Years later as an adult, I've had two dreams about the hooded shape or being or whatever it was, but that's it. I've never encountered anything else like this before and I say this as someone who's had a fair share of ghost running encounters. I honestly wish that there was a bit more to this, but really, that's all there is. In 2016, I was 26. I worked a seasonal job in a warehouse about 30 minutes drive from my flat. And one day after work, I ordered tire takeout from a place maybe 10 blocks from my home. And there was a gas station next door, so I filled up and left my car at the pump to say hi to some friends who lived across the street while I waited for my food to be ready. Maybe 15 minutes of chatting, walking back across the street, grabbing my food, across the lot to the gas station, into my car, and a two-minute drive to my flat. At the time, I lived in a duplex flat, with a sort of gutted adjacent flat attached to it. Behind me was an old vacant motel that was currently being gutted and repurposed into studio apartments. The nearest building to the left was an old clamper bar leading to the main street and the highway, and to the right was an empty lot where a building that was demolished nearly a decade earlier once stood. The rest of the neighborhood was lower income Hispanic. So I pulled into my drive and noticed a car driving relatively slow past me. I went inside and leashed my dog up to let her out. As I was standing in the yard waiting for the dog to do her business, a maroon Subaru Forester, newer at the time, drove by slowly multiple times before pulling into my driveway. I assumed he was lost or looking for something and walked up to him as he got out of the car and approached me. He looked like an older white man in his 50s. I remember he kind of reminded me of my dad in fact. I asked him if he needed anything and he replied, Oh no, I just was checking on you. I asked if I knew him, figuring maybe I didn't recognize him at first. He replied, Oh, I, I saw you up at the gas station. You seemed like you needed help. I'm just seeing if you need anything. Now, I'm usually pretty slow to the cut, but at this point, I had pieced together that this man had followed me from the gas station to a friend's house to a restaurant and then home. It immediately didn't sit right. He was just standing there and he wasn't leaving. And I had time to process the situation. I thought maybe he's an older guy, I'm a younger girl. He's on this side of town in a nice car for whatever reason and maybe he thinks that I'm a trick. And so I said again, I'm sorry, I'm not picking up what you're putting down. Why are you here? Oh, nothing. I'm just a, a nice guy checking to see if you're all right. I specifically remember him calling himself a nice guy as well. During the period of this conversation, I had made it to my stoop and he had closed the gap. Behind was door, then me, the dog, then him and his car. I told him, 
Listen, you should leave. To which he asked, Do you wish you had a nicer place? And if my dog, a medium-sized German Shepherd, was friendly and even reached out toward her for a pet. I yanked her behind me and said no, and pretty aggressively told him, dude, leave. At that, he finally started backing away. I stood in the driveway until he got into his car and drove off. I took down his license plate and car description, then I just went inside. Less than 15 minutes later though, he pulled back into my driveway, sat there for a second, and then just drove off again. That was when I decided to file a police report. The whole thing just didn't sit right with me and I just figured that it was nothing, but I lived alone and if anything happened, I would want a record. It was 6 or 7 p.m. at this point as well, so the non-emergency line was closed. I filed out a report online and I never heard back from the police. Never saw that man or his maroon forester again either. He might have just been a weird old man. I never saw any reports of anyone going missing from Nevada in 2016 either. And look, I know it's a bit of a stretch and maybe it has nothing to do with anything, but I only just thought of this again in the last few months, but they caught a guy in New York and I wondered if he was in Nevada before it ever came out because he was the same age, the same build. But how do you remember a face from like seven years ago, right? I just remember the man at my place having more salt and pepper hair, I guess. He treated me like he thought I was soliciting and he wanted to help. He didn't respect my boundaries and it was probably nothing and not the same man, but still, it's scary. In situations like this, they just seem to have a way of sticking with you. So to start this, I feel like it needs a little bit of backstory. At the time I was 12 years old, almost 13, and I was spending the day at my grandma's house. Just to set the tone as well, my grandma lives in a not so good part of town. Her house is pretty much the highlight of that neighborhood. That day, me and my best friend Izzy were taking a walk to go to the park that was in the area. This was common for us to do and we were quite used to the walk to get there. From time to time we would get creepy encounters but nothing like this. So as we were walking to the park we passed this very old apartment complex. For reference there's broken windows, tarps all over the doors, all the brick was breaking down, that sort of thing. We never really saw anyone outside of those apartments ever, until that day. There was an older couple, maybe mid to late 40s, sitting on the sidewalk in lawn chairs. We haven't seen them around before, so immediately I took notice. When the woman noticed me and my friend, she smiled and waved. The gesture seemed innocent enough, and being the nice person that I try to be, I smiled and waved back. We kept walking until she had said, Hey, stop for a minute. I just want to talk to you. Where are you headed where you have to leave so quickly? After she said that, my friend side-eyed her so hard and looked me dead in the face and said, Let's go. I don't get good vibes from these people. I just shrugged and said okay. So instead of answering her, we sort of slowly started continuing walking. We walked a little distance, not bothering to look back until I could sense the fact that we were being followed, so I turned around, and there she was, the same lady that we had just run into trailing us. Once she noticed that I had seen her, she began to wave us over, specifically me, and so I nudged my friend to show her what she was doing. We were obviously pretty creeped out by this, so my friend told me to go and see what she wants, but stay somewhat close and entertain her while she calls my grandma to come and pick us up from the area that we were in, as she was following us and we no longer felt safe. Was this a good plan? No, but at the time it seemed like it was. So I hand her my phone open to my grandma's contact while I head over to see what she wants, since she was specifically motioning for just me to come over. As I approached her, she started talking. 
Why did you try to get away so fast? I, I really mean no harm. I just thought you little ladies were simply adorable and I wanted to find out more, especially about you. Me and my husband have taken quite an interest in you. I don't remember exactly what was said, but it was along those lines. I remember that I was so taken aback by what she said, all I could do was sort of nod and stare. Then she started asking me questions such as name, age, grade, school, etc. Obviously, I didn't give her any of my real information. Thank the lords that I was smart enough to know that. Once she seemed satisfied with the answers that I gave her, she started speaking again. You know, you really are a darling little thing. Me and my husband can't have any more children, and the one baby that we did have, it died at only a few weeks because she was born early. She had the exact same bright blue doe eyes. I admittedly did feel bad for her, so I just said something along the lines of, I'm sorry for your loss, but I have to be going now. That's when things got really weird though. She then said, Now Angel, that's no way to talk to your mummy. Tell your friend it's time to go home and come back inside with mummy and daddy. At that point, I flipped the heck out and just turned around and started walking towards my friend with pleading eyes to help me out of this situation. She was still on the phone with my grandma, obviously. As this was only over the course of five or so minutes, she couldn't save me at that moment. But I just kept inching closer to her, trying to get away from this really weird lady. That was until she grabbed me, like literally tugged my arm and pulled me into her, grabbed my jaw and made me look her in the face and then said, Honey, enough of this. What's going on with you? Just come home with mummy and daddy. You're our little angel baby and God's way of giving her back to us. I looked at her like she was crazy and managed to get out of her grip and finally stood up for myself. Look, lady, I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm not in any way related to you, nor am I your child. So please just leave me alone. I said as assertively as possible, given my terrified state. I again tried to walk away, and this time she grabbed me again, harder and started walking back towards the apartment with me. At that point, my friend came running over and started trying to help me the best that she could from this crazy lady, since she was also only a 13-year-old girl. Then, by some miracle, my grandma finally pulled up, and that seemed to scare the lady away. And when I tell you that we ran into the car, I can barely describe it accurately. We moved like lightning. My grandma asked what had happened, to which we told her, and she decided that she would inform the police. They didn't end up doing much of anything, really, as we didn't know the names of these people, and all we could really give them was a description. And when they looked into the apartments and who all lived there... The couple did not actually live there, obviously, and the other people from the apartment have never seen them before, based on description. This happened about five years ago now, and it still really scares me, and makes me wonder about what their intentions were. Was I almost kidnapped? Was she just really crazy? Am I overreacting, and was it just an innocent encounter? Or was there something evil about to happen. So this is mostly going to be told from my friend's perspective based on what she told me. For context, we were at a casino in Las Vegas and had been drinking and gambling pretty much all night. It was around 1am and we were getting ready to play one more game of roulette before heading back to the hotel. My friend needed to use the bathroom, but I wanted to keep playing, so I let her go by herself. I wish that I had went with her, but I'll now tell the story directly from her point of view. I went to the bathroom, and as I was making my way back, a guy approached me with this really creepy grin on his face. He appeared to be alone and was recording me with his phone. He walked up to me and said, Hey sexy, do you have a boyfriend? I said yes and kept walking, keeping my head down, and he proceeds to follow me while recording on his phone. 
He asked me if my boyfriend was here with me and I said yes, he's over there and pointed to where I was sitting. He responded by saying, oh my goodness, he's so average looking, you could do so much better. I just ignored him and I started walking faster at this point. He then said, can I come back to your hotel with you? I want to have my way with you. I yelled at him to leave me alone and he started laughing like a madman. He said, why are you being like that? At this point, my friend made it back to our table and I could tell that something was wrong. This dude was still standing next to her recording and he said, your girl is terrible, you know. This really ticked me off and I got in his face and told him that if he didn't leave us alone, I was going to knock him out and he pulls out pepper spray and started shaking it up. I jumped back and grabbed my friend and luckily we saw a sheriff's deputy standing a few feet away and he could tell that something was up. I flagged him down and told him what was going on, but the creepy guy was gone by this point. In fact, he completely vanished from sight. After the whole ordeal, we were exhausted, and we took a cab back to the hotel. Now, about a week later, I was on Facebook and saw an article about a guy claiming to be an incel who was arrested for going around recording himself pepper spraying and harassing women, and lo and behold... It was the same guy who harassed my friend at the casino. His name was Johnny Devon Young, for anyone who wants to look him up. But the guy gave me such a bad vibe, and I remember seeing him just walking around the casino by himself before the incident happened. It was a strange experience, and I don't know what this guy was up to, really. If he was just trying to bait for reactions or what, but the fact that he invited me back to his place... That scares me a little bit. I work at a homeless shelter for men in a fairly large Midwestern city. It's rewarding work, but the pay isn't great. Listening to these guys' stories and experiences, though, leaves me feeling incredibly grateful and humble. Many are mentally ill, addicted, alcoholic, or some combination of the three. A few are truly men who are down on their luck, victims of other people's mistakes, but it's rare. Generally speaking, almost all are local as there is literally nothing to bring you to this city besides either work or family. Which brings me to Carl. He creeped me out from the beginning. He's not from here. In fact, he's from the West Coast, which is easily a two-day drive. He's a bit of an outdoorsy type with a kayak on top of his SUV. This made me suspicious from the beginning. Why would someone who loved the outdoors leave the West to come here? He is never drunk or high, perfectly well-spoken, and no obvious mental health problems like so many of these fellow residents. His backstory makes no sense as well, but I mean, they rarely do here. He was yet another extremely rich, successful man who got screwed in some vague and never believable way and ended up homeless. In fact, the residents here are all misunderstood geniuses, musicians, brilliant salesmen, former athletes that should have been pro, etc, etc, and they all got screwed by something or someone. It's all stories, and his was really no different. Carl, though, is different. Well-spoken, worldly, extremely polite and educated. So why is he here? Is he on the run? We don't allow the police to come in looking for anyone unless we called them ourselves. It's a perfect place to hide, I guess, for someone running from something. So he's from out of state with some weird backstory of how he ended up here. I gave up the rat race, packed up, and this is where I ran out of money. (laughs) Sure, bud. He's trying to befriend me and it creeps me out a bit. Anyway, I caught him alone by the dumpsters yesterday. He was shirtless on a mat, looking like a praying Muslim or someone doing yoga deep in thought. But that's when I noticed that his tattoos were all satanic. That goat head guy on a man's body and something written in Latin. When he noticed me, he grabbed something quickly and put it in his back pocket. No idea what it was, but... 
I told him that he couldn't be back here and he complied. He was also chanting something I couldn't make out before he noticed me. Something about blood, I think. It was really creepy and very scary, in fact. He hasn't done anything wrong per se, and we can't kick someone out for being creepy or practicing their religion. But it's another day at the shelter now, and I have to continue to deal with this guy, and I guess I'm just wondering if you guys have any ideas as to what I should do about any of this. So, I've been up since like 5am and I just cannot get this out of my mind. Last night I'm sleeping and I'm having a nightmare that I'm in an apartment looking into a kitchen area and the drawers, cabinets and a door to the pantry were all opening, closing and moving by themselves. Almost like poltergeist activity. I was scared in the dream so I began praying and then my wife who was in the bed next to me kicked my foot and woke me up because I was clearly distressed and mumbling a lot in my sleep. But here is where things get really weird. So I sort of jump awake because my wife kicked my foot and feeling relieved to not be having a nightmare anymore, I turn my head towards my wife who was laying behind me. I'm really sorry about that, I was having a nightmare. But I don't hear any response so I figured that she's already fallen back to sleep or whatever, or might just be too tired and she's still kind of out of it. Then I turned my head back to facing forwards, the direction that I was facing the whole time that I was sleeping, and I noticed something in the corner of the room, standing in front of the bedroom door. The room was dark, but its skin still appeared to be like a dark matte grey colour. It was really thin had thin legs and long thin arms, a small almost like torso, a narrow neck and then a really big bulbous head with huge black almond shaped eyes. What I'm getting at is that it looked exactly like a traditional grey alien but it was also slightly transparent. Needless to say I was completely shocked and to be honest my very first reaction was that I was seeing things because I just woke up. So I sort of rubbed my eyes and it's still right there. Trying not to panic and trying to come up with a rational explanation for it. I thought to myself that this must just be a dream, like chemicals still working in my brain or something. So I sit up slightly and look into the corner of our bedroom by the closet, expecting to see something there too, but there's nothing. Then I look at the ceiling, nothing, the floor, the other wall, nothing. I look back at the corner of the bedroom and it is still right there, standing there completely still, just staring at me with its huge jet black eyes, which were shaped like almonds and appeared to sort of wrap just slightly around the side of its head, much, much larger than a human's eyes. And it's still slightly transparent, but... I am definitely seeing it clearly, and only in that one spot too, not anywhere else in the room. Now, because the Texas power grid really sucks, I always sleep with a flashlight next to the bed, and after seeing this thing for about a minute and a half, it occurs to me to grab the flashlight. I lean off the bed, reach down and grab the flashlight, and shine it in the corner of the room at this being, and because it's transparent, it became much less visible when I shined the light on it, but I could still see it very slightly, but it was now much more difficult to see. Again, in disbelief at what I was seeing, I began slowly scanning the whole room with the flashlight, from the bed of course. I wasn't going to try and get out of bed, I was way too scared. And again, I see absolutely nothing strange anywhere else in the room at all, except for this thing that I can see in the one corner of my bedroom door. I turn the flashlight off and instantly I can see it super clearly again just staring at me. I rub my eyes again and squeeze my eyes together tightly hoping that when I open them it would be gone but it wasn't. So I finally begin truly freaking out internally and I just began praying out loud. 
after about 20 seconds of praying, I literally watched this thing just sort of fade out of existence or dematerialize right in front of me. It was still standing there dead still and staring at me the whole time. It just seemed to suddenly begin becoming increasingly transparent until it was just, well, not there anymore and it was gone. I've been awake since then, spent the rest of the night reading random stuff here on Reddit to try and distract myself because the experience really shook me up quite a bit. I was wondering if anyone else here has had an experience like this. I feel so genuinely weirded out that I just don't know what to make of it. Did I really just see that? So I read somewhere that you can see your true self in front of a mirror by using lights. Not here of course, but just some random post on the net. As I dove deeper with that stupid post, I tried doing it. First I just stared into the mirror for a few minutes with the lights open, nothing happened. And yes, I did it at dawn at around 2 or 4 in the morning. I tried many things too. I literally experimented in front of the mirror as I have nothing much to do anyway. I bought different LEDs with different colors just to see my face in the mirror with different colors. I kept doing it the following days. Every time I would sit in front of the mirror, I always used different colors of lights. I did that for about 8 days straight and nothing happened. On day number 9 though, I started to get bold and thought of using lights coming from a candle. I still doubt that something will happen, obviously, but to my mistake, just a few minutes later, something really did happen. It was 3.56am at that time. I kept a note on what time I did those stupid experiments. As I started in front of the mirror with the candle lights, things started to go from bad to worse. At first, I thought something just got into my eyes, but I know that it wasn't. That face of mine, that very reflection of my face, began to distort. I was stunned for a moment, shivering all over my body and not knowing what to do. That distorted reflection of mine began to look deeply into my own eyes, slightly smiling, a visible arc on the side of the mouth. As I was stunned and didn't know what to do because I really wasn't expecting it, I just sort of stared back at it. I tried to move, but my body wasn't listening to me. I was in that position for about 40 seconds, 40 seconds of dread. As I was about to lose it and almost started crying, everything returned to normal. Of course, the first thing that I did was to put down that candle light and turn the lights on. I was really scared that time, but I also felt elated because, well, I succeeded after nine days. I wasn't able to sleep properly that day, thinking that my reflection would kill me or whatever. I'm not even kidding, I was actually really scared about that. I continued with my daily routine though, except staring in the mirror again obviously, and nothing happened. But just a week ago, strange things started to happen. I've been living alone for like three years now and I'm working at home too. And I know this sounds weird, but I can literally feel someone's presence when I'm working, that someone is eyeing me. Sometimes I see some black hazy figure on my peripheral vision, but when I turn to look at it, there's never anyone there. I got shivers most of the time, but I just kept on ignoring it. And things like that continued to happen, and just three days ago when I woke up, the door to my room was slightly opened, like someone might have been peeking through the door. I just ignored it again, thinking that I must have just forgot to close it. But that kind of thing just really shouldn't happen to me because I always lock the door after entering my room. And today, the worst thing happened. My door was slightly opened again, and this time... I saw a bloodshot eye peeking at my door. It was fleeting, but I know what I saw. It was that black figure again with the eyes that I saw on my reflection before with the candlelights. 
I'm literally shivering right now while sharing this. I'm trying to find that stupid post again so that I can do something about it, but I can't. And, as crazy as it sounds, I think that I invited an unwanted guest into my own home. If you have any ideas on what I can do about all of this, then please do let me know. I'm afraid that strange things will continue to happen and that things just seem to be going from bad to worse. So we moved to a house on Fort Drum in northern New York. We had a three-year-old TV in my daughter's room. She was four at the time. She liked to watch about 20 minutes of TV each night to make her eyes tired. Every night at the end of the 20 minutes, she'd be asleep pretty much and I would come in and turn off the TV. In this Fort Drum house, however, the TV seemed to have a bit of a mind of its own. I'd come in to turn it off, walk to my room, and then I would hear it turn back on. When I would turn around to turn it back off, it would always turn off by itself. Almost every night I would play this game with the TV. I thought that there was an issue with the timer or maybe my daughter was laying on the remote or something. But there was just no explanation in the end. The TV was working perfectly normal a few weeks earlier in our previous home too. Anyway, after that, things would come up missing too, and they'd show up in really bizarre places. At night, particularly when my husband was working, I would hear strange bumps downstairs as well. One night, my husband was away for 24-hour duty. My daughter was asleep, and my dog and I were in the bed in the master bedroom. And all of a sudden, we heard someone slowly stomping up the stairs, I immediately thought that my husband had come home to grab something and that I just didn't hear the door unlock or whatever. But once the stomping got about halfway up the stairs on the landing, the stomping turned into running. My dog went to the edge of the bed, wagging her tail, thinking that dad was home probably. We, the dog and I, sat frozen in bed waiting for my husband to come through the bedroom door. But we waited, but in the end, no one was there. The very next day though, my daughter and I were talking over breakfast. She says, I can see ghosts, you know. Me playing along, I say, oh, you can, that's pretty cool. Yeah, there's one in my room at night. She's old and her ears are covered, but she has a kind face. Oh, her name is Ruth. Well, what does she do? Does she talk to you? No, she just sort of stands in my closet and watches me. My daughter didn't seem to be alarmed or frightened in the slightest. I was, but I played it cool. A few nights later, after again playing the on-off game with the TV, I was in bed and I heard the usual small bumps in the night. But then, there was a huge crash. I ran downstairs to find that a wooden sign had been flung across the room and had broken a vase that we owned. At that... I started crying in fear. I sort of yelled, you're scaring me. We have to live in this house for now. Please stop scaring me and leave us alone. And afterwards, I felt really stupid as I walked back upstairs. But interestingly enough, nothing ever happened again after that. Not even the TV. My daughter never even mentioned Ruth after that night. So, I don't know if I somehow resolved the problem or if maybe it just stopped randomly, but whatever the case, I'm glad that it all ended. This was a long time ago now, so my memories of the following events are somewhat cloudy and the story is mostly reconstructed based on what my family has told me. This story happened in Chile during the early 2000s. So, some strange things happened in my childhood home. It wasn't a particularly old house or anything. It was built in the mid-80s and, as far as I know, no one had died there by the time that these things started to happen. Nevertheless, it was in a very old part of town, in a part where very dark things happened in the times when Spain governed over our country. Just one block away from my house, in fact, 
There was once a former lake that dried and was filled a long time ago, where the colonial authorities threw the bodies of a group of slaves that were executed for trying to return to their homes. I don't know if any of you believe in the spiritual sense of the word energies, but I certainly do, and I believe that this is a good explanation of the things that happened in my house. So sometime before I was born, my parents were having dinner with my brother and older cousins, who at that time were living in our house because they were in university in our city. My dad had made pachinga and we were all having a good time making chatter when suddenly they all heard the same thing the cry of a baby coming from my brother's bedroom. My mother recalls that it was loud and short, just one single cry that got everyone out of the loop, and as soon as it appeared, the sound went away just as quickly. The weird thing is, is that there was no baby living in our neighborhood at that time. Our neighborhood consisted of 12 semi-detached houses, so it's not a far shot to theorize that it could have been a baby that stayed the night in one of the neighbor's houses or whatever, but the walls were well insulated. Also, everyone remembers that the cry wasn't muffled. It clearly sounded as if it was inside of the home. Another thing is that old TVs tended to turn off by themselves. Also, things used to get lost pretty often and then they'd just reappear in the most obvious places, usually in the places we had searched previously to the point of exhaustion. My brother hilariously always blamed the gnomes. But a more shocking experience happened to me when I was about seven or nine years old. My brother threw a party in our house with a couple of friends from university one day. I was on our old family computer, probably playing RuneScape or whatever, in the same room where the party was going on, and then I heard a woman screaming. It was one of my brother's former girlfriends, for anonymity's sake, I'll call her Carla, but she stood below the arch that leads to the living room, just in front of the stairs, staring with horror and yelling at an empty space on the wall. She began to cry, and others tried to calm her down, but... It was all just in vain. She insisted on leaving because whatever she saw had disturbed her that deeply. My brother says that once she was more calm, she claimed that she saw a man standing on the stairs, staring at her with what she described as wrath in his eyes. He was wearing a long trench coat and a cowboy hat and everyone seemed to ignore his presence. Everyone but her, obviously. The thing that really scared her, though, was his eyes. She claimed that she sensed some kind of ineffable anger in his gaze, and then she was too scared to be in that house anymore. Understandably, she never came back either. But there is one thing, one particular encounter that I remember the most, as it is the most unbelievable and unexplainable, illogical and baffling thing, not just of these stories I've told, but pretty much of my entire life, I think. It's something that I'll never forget. So one night, not so distant from the other story, my mum wasn't at home for reasons that I don't remember anymore and my brother had just left for a party at Carla's house. I remember him wearing a black trench coat and a brown leather hat. And so my dad and I were home alone for the night. We were on the couch watching History Channel, as usual. In those years when it was still half about history anyway and half about aliens, antiquities and trying to catch Bigfoot, only to find nothing at all. But I digress. When all of a sudden we heard the front door slam shut, we naturally turned our heads and there he was, a man in a leather trench coat and leather hat. His clothing seemed almost anachronistic, out of his time. At the moment, I couldn't get a good glance at his eyes as the rim of his cowboy-like hat was sort of tilted down, but I remember he had a three-day stubbled beard and a sharp face complexion. He was dressed almost exactly like my brother and had the exact same beard style. I remember thinking, oh, my brother's home early. Also thinking he was my brother, my father tried to talk to him, but he just went directly upstairs, ignoring us completely. In that moment, I could get a glance of his eyes, and they just felt soulless, inhuman. I couldn't sense any evil in his eyes, like Carla's friend claimed it did, but I remember how he stomped on the steps with haste, 
almost with anger it seemed. I also remember thinking that the man wasn't my brother because his face was actually not that similar at all. My dad, skeptic and stubborn as he was, still thinking it was my brother, said to himself, ah, that guy came back home drunk again, or something along those lines. But after pondering on the strangeness of the situation, my dad asked if I remembered hearing the door being opened, but can't recall if I did, and also I'd be lying if I said I remember what I answered. Probably I just shrugged in the end, but my dad then tried to make me go upstairs to check on my brother's bedroom, but honestly I was too scared and so I just refused to go there alone. So finally, we both went upstairs and we entered my brother's bedroom, and behind the threshold, there was nothing but darkness. The lights were off, the windows were closed shut, and there was no sign of anybody being there. My dad checked on the closets, checked all the windows, and then checked on the other bedrooms. But we were all alone. There was no trail of this man anywhere. We went back downstairs to continue watching our show, trying to forget what had just happened. But it was just impossible. The absurdity of the situation didn't make that possible, and shortly after, my brother came back home for real this time. My dad questioned him about the whole situation, asking him if he had jumped out of the window or something. My brother denied doing such a thing with an expression of bewilderment on his face. Honestly, I actually believed him at that time too. And that was that. We didn't touch the matter again and we just moved on with our lives. Some days we would remember while watching a horror movie and say, Hey, remember the hat guy? And time passed and so on and so forth. At a time I even had forgotten about the whole situation for years and then it just simply went back into my head. I remembered the hat man just out of the blue. According to Chilean rural folklore, the hat man is the angel of death. To some others he is the devil himself and his presence is nothing but the promise of loss and misfortune. That makes sense too because my dad's life was cut short by an anaphylactic shock when I was 12 years old. My life hasn't been the same since his death, both economically and emotionally as well. And after my dad's passing, we eventually moved away from that house. To this day as well, I still wonder if I will ever see the hat man again. I grew up with my dad and brother because my mum died when I was 10. I was 13 at this point and my brother was 16 and was out with some friends. I used to go out until late at night drinking at the park with friends. My dad was an alcoholic and was always too drunk to know if I was at home or not. I pretty much had free reign and no rules or boundaries. My dad used to invite random alcoholic drug using strangers into the house. Often when I came home, these strangers and my dad would be passed out or asleep from too much alcohol or they would barely notice that I was there and I'd go straight to my room. One day though, I would come back from being out with friends. It was the early hours and I walked through the living room to go upstairs to my room and my dad was asleep on the armchair. The guy that he had brought back was around mid-50s. I didn't recognize him. He looked at me though and... Something was off about him. He smiled and stared and tried to start a conversation with me, but I was just keen to go to my bedroom at this point. I went upstairs and got my pajamas on for bed and then dashed to use the bathroom. As I was walking to the bathroom, he said to me, you look nice in those pajamas. And he was smiling at me and sort of creeping me out too. I went back to my room instead of using the bathroom and I shut the door behind me. I had a lock on my bedroom door and I used that. He was then trying to open my bedroom door and I was scared because I knew something was off and that he probably had bad intentions. At this point, I dragged my bed across the room to block the door just in case he barged it open and broke the lock or whatever. He's knocking on the door though saying, I'm just trying to say hello don't be so rude, open the door. I'm not responding, I'm panicking in fact. 
I was a pretty socially aware 13 year old and I knew here that I was in danger. The bed is blocking the door and it's still locked and I can hear him pushing against the door trying to get inside. I open my bedroom window and I scream again and again, help, please help, at the top of my lungs. And what I later found out was that my neighbor heard me and, knowing my dad was an alcoholic, assumed that something had happened to him. He came around, must have seen my dad is asleep. He comes up to my room and he's knocking to get in and I can hear his voice, a voice of safety. Although I trusted my neighbor, I was so shook that I'm now just sat in the corner, bawling my eyes out, shaking and panicked. He knocks the door open and is pushing it open against the weight of the bed. He came in and checked on me, assuming that I must have been hurt or something. And he just holds me while I compose myself and try to explain what had just happened. The man was now gone, but I knew that he could come back any time in the future and that my dad was never sober enough for me to have ever been able to explain it. And this was the final straw for social services, and that was the night that I ended up in the care system. I ended up living with my auntie until I was 16, so I had it much easier than most, which honestly, I'm very grateful for. I've always been intrigued by tales of cryptids and the paranormal, but I never had any personal experiences to share. To be honest, the lack of substantial evidence for such phenomena was actually somewhat comforting for me. Despite their fascinating aspects, these phenomena can be frightening. However, I experienced something about 10 years ago that completely shifted my perspective on the paranormal and spirituality in general. So, the short version is this. A decade ago, I reconciled with my first love after a painful separation. She was already three months pregnant with another man's child. Yes, it sounds like a simp story, I know, but it was a decision that I put a lot of thought into and it ultimately changed my life. Fast forward to now, we're happily married with two kids and our daughter is turning 10 next month. During this emotional turmoil though, I experienced something that I can only really describe as sleep paralysis. You see, I woke up unable to move, but I could move my eyes one night. I saw an all black figure, featureless, crawling over my legs and towards my pregnant wife. And despite my attempts to scream or move, I was helpless. The figure reached my wife and was sitting between her legs with its hands on her legs and I felt an intense, overwhelming dread. This horror was so profound that I awoke kicking, accidentally hitting my wife's pregnant stomach. The baby and her were okay, but we were both shaken. This happened again three nights later when I felt like I was being pulled under the bed this time, like head first sliding under the headboard until I was completely underneath the bed, all the time this figure was at the foot of the bed sitting. Yet again, I awoke in a panic, this time hitting my wife again, but she had started placing pillows between us for protection while we tried to understand what was going on. In the days that followed, I was haunted by sudden waves of intense fear and an unshakable feeling of not being alone. Even during the day, at work or while driving, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder. The sensation was that strong. Desperate for help, I took my wife's advice and reached out to a pastor from her church. I poured out my experiences and fears to him and he suggested a spiritual remedy. He told me to walk through our house, holding a Bible and to rebuke the presence in the Lord's name. Definitely skeptical but also very desperate, I ended up following his advice. So, alone in the house, armed with only a Bible and a phrase of rebuke, I did as instructed. Initially, I didn't feel any change, but then slowly, the fear began to recede. Since that day, I've never really experienced anything similar, which is definitely weird to me. Now, obviously, I can't offer a scientific explanation for what I experienced, but it was a powerful and personal confirmation that there's more to our world that we can perceive with our senses. Whether you classify it as a paranormal, spiritual, or religious experience, 
I chose to view this as evidence that if unseen forces of evil exist, then there must also be forces of good. Take from my story what you will, but it's good to share it and to finally get it off my chest. So I'm a nurse working mainly night shifts in a home for the elderly. There are two of us in the building at night. Each of us has their own floor and there are 80 elderly in our home. Now recently, we've had a lot of palliative patients, patients awaiting death and badly sick patients. We've also had a few deaths in the last month, as expected of course. But as of lately, night shifts have become unbearable. Many of our patients screaming throughout the night and barely getting any sleep, ranting about seeing figures standing over them or talking to them, calling their names and saying hello. Tonight, I was sitting in our little nurse point in the dark, my desk light turned on, overseeing halls in three directions, typing something onto my computer. I heard a woman say hello to me, so I looked up. Everything was still and eerie, so I went out and checked the halls, but nothing. I brushed it off in the end. Maybe I was tired. I sat back down. Not even a minute passes and somebody grabs my shoulder. I nearly jumped out of my skin. There was no one behind me, no one near me in fact, and I nearly wet myself. I ran quickly down to my co-worker. She was sitting pale in her nurse station, completely still. She looked at me and told me that she had someone calling her name out of the death room. That's what we call the room where the dead are brought to await funeral services. She said that she watched the door, which is tightly shut, slowly open and then she heard the call. Needless to say, we're both scared to death, huddled in the common room, going out to the rooms together at this point. But what should we do? Is there any way to calm things down a bit? We're practically unable to work out of fear and there's just too many people to attend to. Should we go around with a cross or something? Light a candle? We're afraid and we need help. Calling for help is useless too as they'll just make fun of us if we do, so we're practically stuck here. Please, if you know what to do about any of this, then help us out. This happened to me about 20 years ago when I was still a sophomore in high school. My aunt and uncle, they had a three-story condo that was always kind of off. It wasn't a particularly old or creepy looking building in my recollection, but as soon as you set foot inside, there was something in the air that just reeked of something isn't right. For a little background too, the condo's first floor held the living and the dining areas, the kitchen, and the back door that led to a small patio. The second story was the master bedroom, two guest rooms, a bathroom, and a little nook for the washer and dryer. The third floor was a game room with several old video game consoles like an Atari Jaguar and a Sega Genesis with my uncle's Star Trek collection in one corner and a door that led to the attic crawl space. It also had a pull-out sofa sleeper for guests. Now, as I grew up, we visited the condo many times. Like I said, the entire building had an odd aura to it, but this all culminated on the third floor. When you walked over to the final stair up to the third floor, the air just changed. Where on the second floor that you could hear the sounds of family visiting downstairs and hear traffic outside, etc. On the third floor, it was always completely silent. The air was always heavy and thick there. No sounds permeated here and you were always left with a feeling of being stared at or watched. Almost as if you were intruding there. Being kids, my cousins and I would often go up to the third floor to play video games. However, we never went up there alone and absolutely never went up there at night. It was just one of those places that felt like it was a, a different plane of existence its own pocket dimension of silence and gloom. My family had seen and heard things in that condo on multiple occasions too. It was common knowledge that one could hear footsteps pacing up and down the stairs at night. 
You would see figures out of the corner of your eye, doors would open and close despite being locked, objects would move, that sort of thing. One morning, actually, I woke up before the adults to find a trail of pennies lying end to end from the third floor all the way down to the kitchen. I remember being a little bit unsettled by this, but not particularly afraid. I was more interested in free money, I guess, and greedily put the pennies in a Ziploc baggie to take home with me. Now, because these things going on were relatively benign in nature, my family assumed that it had to be a spirit of my late grandfather, who was the mischievous sort in life, watching over the house at night. Fast forward to my teenage years though, my uncle died suddenly one year and so a flood of tight-knit family descended on the condo to comfort my aunt and attend my uncle's funeral. Because there were so many people staying in the condo, my mum, dad, sister and I were relegated to sleeping upstairs on the third floor. I was creeped out, but I figured, hey, how bad could it be, right? But boy, was I in for a surprise. So, the day of the funeral came and we all attended the wake, after which the family gathered outside to comfort my aunt who was sobbing uncontrollably at the loss of her husband. I remember the sound being a sort of gut-wrenching, heartbreaking cry of pure despair. It really hurt to listen to, in fact, so I quickly retreated from the crowd of onlookers and went to find my cousins until we were ready to leave. And little did I know that everything was about to break loose when we got back. We got back to the condo and everyone wept and shared stories of my uncle. After some time, we all grew tired and decided that it was time for bed. I slept on the sofa while my mum and dad and little sister all shared an air mattress down on the floor by the foot of the sofa. What I remember most about that night though was the cold. I startled awake in the middle of the night, unsure of what had woken me up, only to be greeted by the most bone-biting, skin-saturating cold that I'd ever felt. It permeated the entire third floor as well, soaking through my clothes and into my body. I shuddered and pulled the blanket tighter around me. I remember being puzzled by the cold, in fact, as the third floor usually got uncomfortably warm. I lay there, shivering for a few minutes, and that was when I heard it. The sound that I heard is hard to describe, but it's probably best described as something trying its best to mimic my aunt sobbing from earlier. It was a, a dry sort of raspy voice, crying and choking and carrying on in a sort of mocking tone. And it was extremely loud. I mean, ear-splittingly loud. It was coming from the far corner of the room as well, over by the crawl space door. I froze in terror. I mean, what on earth was going on? Was this some kind of an entity? I peeked over the edge of my blanket and gazed into the darkness at the corner of the room. Nothing, of course, was there, but my mother, having had past experiences with paranormal things, had once told me that if anything scary ever happened like that, to just ignore it and it would go away. So, remembering that, that's exactly what I tried to do. I squinted my eyes shut and I pretended to be asleep. When that didn't work, I tried covering my head with the couch cushion to blot out the sound. That didn't work either. The sound stayed as loud as it had been, almost as if it were coming from inside my own head. I lay like that for what seemed like minutes, but it was probably about 45 seconds or so. Then another noise grabbed my attention. The rustling of blankets. I peered out from under my own blanket to see my mother had bolted up onto the air mattress. She looked left and right with a sort of confused expression on her face and then jumped up and ran down the stairs to the second floor. My father and sister were still sound asleep. This next part is what my mum told me happened after she ran downstairs. So mum got to the second floor and immediately opened the master bedroom, thinking that my aunt was awake and crying. But no, she was actually sound asleep. Mum could still hear the wailing, so she checked all the other rooms on the second floor. But everyone was asleep. Confused, she stood at the bottom of the stairs leading to the third floor and listened to the wailing. Meanwhile, 
My fear had given way to curiosity. Glancing cautiously over toward the corner where the sound was coming from, I sort of leaned over the banister and gazed down to the second floor. I could see the hall light on downstairs and mum looking bewildered at the bottom of the steps. Mum? I called. She nearly jumped out of her skin, her head snapping up to look at me. Uh, are you looking for that wailing sound? Mum's eyes widened. You hear it too? I nodded at this. Why isn't anyone else waking up? She called. I just shrugged. She then turned away from me and headed toward the stairs leading to the first floor. As she rounded the corner toward the first floor, she ran headlong into my little cousin. He was wide-eyed, in tears and shaking. Mum asked him what was wrong and he said, It's coming to get me. Mum began to ask what was coming to get him. When she saw it, a shadow, humanoid, came lurching up the stairs toward them, blacker than the darkness that surrounded it. As it approached, it began to sort of morph as well, to grow into something monstrous. Now standing seven or eight feet tall, it began lunging up the remaining stairs at them, making a horrible sound as it came. Mum grabbed my cousin and began sprinting up the stairs, the shadow stomping just behind her. This cacophony caught my attention, and now, completely ignoring the wailing in the room with me, I craned my neck over the banister to see what was going on. I saw Mum sliding around the corner toward the third floor stairs, a flood of shade and darkness filling the hallway behind her. My little cousin was screaming and clutching at her neck as she ran, taking the stairs two at a time. Mum, I cried, it's right behind you. She ran and came flying up the final few steps to the third floor, and as soon as she cleared the landing, the wailing just completely stopped, cut off like someone pulled the plug on a speaker. She leapt into the air mattress with my cousin. I abandoned all pretense of maturity and clambered onto the mattress with them. We all sat there, huddled in abject terror, staring into the darkness of the staircase, but nothing came. No shadow, no wailing, nothing. But that was when the stomping started. Up and down the stairs it went, over and over, rattling the knickknacks on the walls, vibrating the floors. Still though, nobody woke up, which was so weird to me at the time. After several minutes of this, the footsteps reached the third floor and stopped dead. The temperature in the room immediately started to plummet, and mum clearly had had enough. She started violently shaking my father to wake up. When dad woke up, everything just suddenly got quiet again. He was groggy and annoyed and asked us what we were doing. We explained what had happened, my cousin still crying in my mother's arms. And he looked at us skeptically but listened intently with us for any sounds in the house. Sounds never came for the rest of that night, but none of us really slept after that. And in the morning, my cousin, still visibly shaken, explained to us what had happened to him before mum found him. He said that he heard a voice calling him from downstairs and thought that his father, my late uncle, had returned. He was young and I don't think he understood the permanence of death, I guess, but when he went down to investigate... He said that he ran into the shadow and that it was too big to be my daddy. I don't know exactly what happened that night. I've read about shadow people before, about djinn and demons, but nothing really quite matches the being or the thing that we saw that night. If anyone has a good answer or has run into something like this, then please do let me know because it's something that I've thought about a lot. My mum passed away when I was super young, before I even really knew her, so I spent a while with my dad when I was really young. In fact, my earliest memories were living at my grandma's place. The house was a big house near the beach. My grandma and grandpa built the house, so no one had lived there before us. Anyways, I love that house, but a specific area of the house always made everyone feel, like, uncomfortable. This area was in the basement near a cellar. 
My memory back then is kind of foggy because it was so long ago, but I remember spending a lot of time with my grandma since my dad was working and whatnot. Now, we used to pray every night, go to church every Sunday, and I was fairly Catholic at the time. And I remember eventually seeing these shadow people. They looked almost like skeletal shadows that would peek out from behind doorways and corners, signaling me to follow them. They also had glowing eyes and a, a sharp, almost jagged, black, shadowy, skeletal body. Now, I remember ignoring them for a long time, but one day, growing curious, I followed one. I saw one near my grandma's room doorway and walked to the doorway, turning the corner, and when I did, it was gone. Then it reappeared at the stairway to the basement down the hall and signaled me to follow again. I followed it again and it was gone this time appearing at the bottom of the stairs in the basement. As a kid, I was terrified of that basement, so at that point I stopped following. Some more time passed and eventually curiosity took the better of me and I ended up following it into the basement the next time that they showed up. When I turned the corner in the basement, I remember seeing this person. They were towering above me. I'm like five or six years old tops though, so everyone towered over me, but you get the point. And they had a, like, a deer skull with horns instead of antlers for a head, wore a big fur cloak, and behind them was just darkness. I remember them slowly pointing at me, then I screamed and I ran for it right back up the stairs. Over the next couple of weeks, I'd see this thing in different places. One time hanging itself off the door, other times standing in the trees near the river. I learned later my family was getting messed with in the way of weird dreams and odd events like poltergeist stuff as well. But eventually I stopped seeing this thing in person and it plagued my dreams instead. I couldn't get a night's sleep without this thing appearing, turning it into a nightmare until sometime I remember someone coming to me in the dream. They told me to fight and banish this being and so I did. I remember in the dream grabbing a broom handle or a stick and hitting this thing when it showed up. The dream seemed to sort of crack and it was at that point that I woke up. I realize dreams are weird things so I really don't know what to make of that. It could be nothing. But years went by and I forgot about the whole thing until I was about 13 or 14-ish. I was hanging out with some friends and as we were walking back to my buddy's place, one night I remember his sister turning around and asking, what's that? To which we all turn around. And at the end of the street... We all saw this tall entity, deer skull with horns and a big fur coat at the end of the street under one of the lights. My memories came back to me and I just remember saying, we need to leave. We proceeded to run back to my friend's place and aside from some odd moments like the power going out and doors opening and closing, it seemed to leave us alone. But a few months later, I'm in the gymnasium bleachers, watching some sports in my high school, when I suddenly start to feel tired. Now, I was resting kind of against the railing when I almost blacked out, which could have caused me to fall off the railing suddenly, and then I saw that deer skull image appear in my mind, and I was snapped wide awake. The next few years, it was sort of off and on. I would see this thing, then some of my friends, or my brother and his friends would as well, when I was around though, it always made everything darker and the smell of like mildew would suddenly become very noticeable too. It seemed to attack one of my friends once. It gave me a scar on my wrist that I've pretty well had my whole life and I moved out of my hometown years ago and kind of figured that it was gone but back in February, I was walking home one night and felt a similar feeling only to look over at the trees and see him standing there first time that I've seen him in a few years so it caught me off guard for sure. I still have no idea exactly what it is and though the running theory is a, a nature spirit of some kind due to the alleged history of the land of my hometown that is honestly just a wild guess and like I said I have no idea what this is and I don't know what to do about it. So last night I was recording guitar in my studio and I heard someone moving about but nobody was there so I just kept on recording. A while later my wife brought in our toddler. As usual he strummed the acoustic on its stand and caused usual ruckus of unplugging my guitar cords and all that. 
She took him and put him into bed and I bent down, plugged everything back in and decided to go take a smoke. As I went through the house, I could hear them in the bedroom getting ready for bed. I'm outside for like 10 minutes and my wife comes out and says, are you out here? I just saw you in the studio and I said, I've been out here for like 10 minutes. She says, I just walked through your studio seconds ago and saw you bending down as I walked through to the garage. She continued and said, what are you doing down there? But when I came back through seconds later, you were gone. Now, we have not had any paranormal activity in the 22 years that we've lived in this house. Nothing like this has ever happened. And it was odd for me to sense a presence earlier and for her to see me when I wasn't there. And this whole thing just gives me chills. I was about nine years old. My dad, me and my siblings went on a vacation to my grandparents' house that's so far away from home. To visualize the setting too, my grandparents' house was half renovated with the living room and the upstairs room. It was a deteriorating ancestral house, but the kitchen and the bathroom, the upstairs that used to be a boarding house with a few rooms and the backyard was still the original house, not renovated at the time. Everything was still in construction mode, so the TV was in the kitchen because the living room was a complete mess. So, it was midnight and we were watching a TV show with two of my cousins, my sister and my aunt. We'd laugh so loud at the shows and during advertisements cracking jokes. And after a while, there was a really loud noise from upstairs. It sounded like kids running around and we thought that it was my aunt's children playing, but... We didn't even have the time to react or shout at them because this loud noise came downstairs and I think the best way to describe it is like a, a brown colored wind or a smoke sped down with stomping sounds down the wooden stairs. It passed by the TV and into the sink where the glasses and the rack rattled and we just were all frozen in shock and fear and confusion. The wind came back from the sink it seemed, passed the TV again and went up again to the stairs with the stomping feet noise which sounded like it was in a hurry running up the stairs. The frames hanging on the walls of the stairs shook and one of them even fell. Honestly at the time I couldn't believe that I had just witnessed what I had seen. Something that to this day I just cannot explain. And it was just so random and out of the blue like that too. I've told this story to a lot of people. Some don't believe me and some do but... My aunt who always cooked in that kitchen said that she was used to that paranormal stuff as well as my cousins and my dad who grew up in that house. In fact, they just seemed to brush it off the day after, but my mind as a child at that time was horrified to my core. I couldn't forget about it. That experience is something that will haunt me forever, I think. Even now in my adulthood, it's something that I vividly remember. This all started back in 2014 at a youth hostel in Utah. I woke up screaming in a dorm room after opening my eyes to a mouthless black-eyed young girl sitting on my chest and staring me in the face inches away from me. From there, and as my alcoholism got worse and spiritual energy levels became corroded and more dark, that's the best way that I can put it, it started happening a lot more. It came in different forms, faceless demons, old ladies, grim reaper, etc, etc. But always the same thing, terrifying and even painful. By painful I mean I would be choked. My left side of my throat seems to feel the most pain. Also I would get electrocuted or what feels like electrocution anyway. Strangely too, many times I can sense when it will happen. I can almost feel this overwhelmed feeling of dread and fear like some sinister evil envelops me and fills the room, just waiting for me to drift off ever so slightly so that it can attack and begin to choke me. I hear terrible things whispered into my ear, how horrible I am as a person, mocking me relentlessly to the point where I would break down in tears. One instance of that was in the form of two witches who would talk smack about me, like soul-crushing stuff that... I don't know why I was so affected by it, but each time I would slip into hypnagogic state, I would tap into their conversation about me. 
between that and the choking or sort of electrocution thing, it makes you not want to sleep at all. The scariest part of all this is one sleep paralysis incident when I woke up screaming after the usual strangulation and hateful rhetoric from the death wraith grim reaper looking thing and I woke up near tears from fear and sadness and shock even. I told my wife about it finally for the first time. Usually I would just keep it in because even after these intense episodes, you know people just don't get it, so I kept it to myself. But anyways, my wife told me that I actually had a handprint or choke marks on my throat, and when I went to the mirror, sure enough, I did. It actually looked like a humanoid red handprint, and it wasn't subtle. It was like someone had grabbed my throat and strangled me, and you could see it. Recently, I've been having this happen more and more too, but without the humanoid entities. Just the presence and the sensation, I guess. Last night, I had these tentacle jellyfish looking things that seemed to be extracting energy or something from me, and it was painful. In my worst encounters, it feels like my soul is literally being ripped from my body, but since I've gotten sober and life is a whole lot more mellow and generally positive, it's gotten less intense, but I still feel it, and honestly, it's really messing up my quality of life. I miss dreaming good dreams. I can't remember the last good dream that I've had, and if I do have one, it's always infiltrated or hijacked by this messed up entity. But whether it be real or psychological, it doesn't matter, it's affecting me. It happens during periods of light awakeness too, where I can still see my room and surroundings, and light hypnagogic states, but also in dreams too, where the entity seems to hack into the dream characters like Agent Smith in the Matrix, and they suddenly take this malevolent hateful energy and the rest of my dream they're just trying to murder me. I hate suffering from this stuff. It's terrifying and it just won't stop being terrifying. But it's grown to the point where I'm just annoyed by it now. If I am being haunted by something, it's definitely earned my mutual contempt and I want to learn how to fight back and even kill this thing. So if you can help me with this, I would be really grateful. My brother was six and I was four. We moved house at some point. My brother remembers that the first night that we slept there, he had trouble getting to sleep and his eyes kept focusing on something in his room that looked like the outline of a person standing at the foot of his bed. He says the next morning I said that there had been a wiggly man in my room that night. I don't remember this myself and our parents don't remember me saying it too but there were lots of experiences that I had in that house over the years that I do remember vividly. Like, I would hear voices, usually angry ones, and often my brother would hear the same thing at the same time, but our parents, they wouldn't hear anything. We both used to feel hands grabbing at us, especially at night. We both got sleep paralysis often, and we both would see a, a pale, sick-looking man with sores around his eyes, nose, and mouth holding us down. We both heard footsteps patrolling the house at night, I saw a woman in an old-fashioned dress sort of sitting or lying at the bottom of the staircase and crying three different times. And one of those times, my brother also saw her. I would hear loud banging on the bedroom door. At first, I assumed it was my brother being a, a terrible person, but when I went to check, there was never anyone there. My brother would often hear the banging too, but our parents never did. My brother was seeing and hearing strange things almost every week. There was always weirdness like doors, cupboards and drawers being left open when we knew that we closed them. We had smells and problems with electronics. Our parents constantly got people in to check for problems too, with the wiring or CO2 etc. Stuff got knocked over though when there was nobody around and our parents never believed us about what we saw and heard. No one did in fact. At first, everyone thought that my brother was making it up and I was playing along to be included. Then they thought that he was having psychosis symptoms and because I was young and suggestible, I was imagining the things that he was saying that he saw. I was actually starting to believe this theory too until my brother and I saw a shadow person walk through the coffee table towards us and the coffee table moved too. The remote fell off of it and a glass on it fell off and chipped. 
that was 100% real because afterwards, that cup was still chipped, that coffee table had definitely moved, and the remote remained on the ground for a long time afterward. Our parents could see it too, and we actually got in trouble for it. That one definitely couldn't have been a hallucination or imagination for sure. We moved out after six years there, and we stopped seeing and hearing those things after that. No more sleep paralysis. Everyone thought that my brother's psychosis was being controlled by meds or something, but when we moved out of our home, he stopped taking these meds, and he was fine. No symptoms of psychosis or anything. We both agree that the house was definitely haunted, but our parents still stick with the psychosis theory and we've learned not to bother arguing about it because it will never change their mind. While deployed to Iraq with the army, one night I'd been assigned evening guard duty in one of the camp's perimeter towers. These towers were just upended concrete pipe, 10 feet in diameter, with a roof, floor, and a ladder inside. It was only two stories up, and in each tower was a, a set of night vision goggles, a pair of binoculars, a machine gun, a radio, and a spotlight. There were two of us per tower on each shift, and on this night, it was me and my buddy Smith. It was a quiet, cloudless, moonlit night. So our camp was small, and it was situated on a low hill. Five towers in total protected the perimeter, with number three being the one facing the rear of the camp. We had mostly an unobstructed view out for at least a mile in all directions, but there were small hills and valleys, no more than six feet deep at the most. Otherwise, it was just empty desert. While we scanned our sector, Smith and I, we just shot the breeze. We complained about the war, talked about going back home, having a beer and meeting girls, it was the best way to pass the time, really. Then at some point during the night, we hear what I can only describe as the shriek. It was like nothing that I'd ever heard before. The sound came from somewhere off in the dark, maybe 30 or 50 yards away from us. It was short, barely a second and a half long, sharp and loud, ascending in pitch. Something that could have been either a woman, child, or animal in distress or an animal in anger, I guess, but it stopped my heart, whatever it was. It was even more frightening in contrast to the calm quiet of the evening. But then it happened again, and then again. Smith, you hear that man? I asked. Yeah, what the heck is that? He said, grabbing the binoculars and looking out. I don't know, man, but whatever it is, it's freaky, I said. Get the light out there, Smith said. I got the spotlight out, scanning the desert, but there was nothing out there. I kept moving back and forth. Get the night vision, Smith said. Again, I scanned the desert for as far as I could see, but there was nothing. Just empty night air. We got on the radio to the watch commander. HQ, this is Tower 3. Did you hear that? Over. The radio cracked, then responded. Uh, negative 3. What am I supposed to hear? but then the noise had stopped. We described what we were hearing and asked the other towers if they heard anything, but no one but us heard it. Watch Commander checked back with us a couple of times, then came up and looked for himself. He tried the night vision, then the binoculars with the spotlight, but nothing but sand. The shrieking was gone and all was quiet again. We finished the shift with no more interruptions, just the same as before, except for one difference, I guess. I stayed perched on that machine gun, watching the night, all night. In the morning after we were replaced, Smith, myself, and another buddy from the watch commander's office, we went out the gate and headed in the direction of the noise. About 30 yards from the gate was the most horrific thing that I had ever seen. Scattered in about an 8 foot diameter was a, a splashing of just an absolute mess with bits of flesh and you name it. None of us could tell if it was human or animal, but whatever it was, almost nothing was left of it. What scared us most, though, is that from the side of the blood, we had a direct line of sight straight to Tower 3. And even without the spotlight, we should have been able to see whatever had taken place here. But neither of us in the tower saw whatever did this. Even the watch commander himself came out to investigate. 
A report was made and a brief search of the area was conducted. But strangely, there were no footprints or even paw prints. No drag marks, no patterns, nothing. Whatever it was, it shrieked three times, left nothing but blood and flesh and an absolute mess, and then just disappeared. It was well within eyesight of us, but it was never spotted, and honestly, it just seemed to vanish. It's been years now, and I can still hear that desperate noise, and man, every time I think about it, it gives me chills. So I, a 20-year-old female, work part-time at a small business in my local mall and usually work alone. I'm a sales associate, so I'm required to talk to customers and encourage them to buy things. It was the last hour of my shift when a creepy man came in. He was about mid-40s and everything about him was odd. Clothes didn't fit, expensive shoes, socially awkward. He originally asked a pretty standard question about a less expensive item that I happily answered. After this though, he continued to ask questions, almost as if he wanted to keep my attention to him. He then asks if he can try out our most expensive item in the store, which is a massage chair, and I said yes, well, we let everyone try it out. At this point, I just thought that he was innocent yet socially awkward, and he gets into the chair to try it out, continues to ask unusual questions. We chit chat a bit and I tell him the massage chair's features and the price of it. When all of a sudden, the questions get more personal. He asked what high school I went to and if I missed it. Me being naive, I said the high school that I went to and that I didn't miss going. He said some story about a teacher that I'd never heard of and said that he missed high school a lot. He asked if I lived around there to which I avoided that question but implied that I lived close. He then repeatedly asked me the price of the chair and asked me to calculate the price along with our second most expensive item in the store as well. I thought that he was actually interested and I was convinced that he was about to buy it. We made commission on the chair so I ignored his creepiness because I wanted to make the sale. He kept insisting that he needed to walk out with the chair today and he has a truck that is big enough to hold it. It seemed that I'd finally answered his questions to his liking because I was able to walk away a bit. He then made a phone call and started describing how I look, my age, where I live approximately, and what store I worked at. He then said to the person on the phone, We got one. We got one. I had suspicions, obviously, that he was creepy, but this absolutely confirmed it. I asked him from behind the cashier's counter, You're not talking about me, right? He shook his head, No. He then stood up from the chair and said that he'll not be buying the chair today. I was scared and alone. Nobody else around but me and him. I ran to the back and grabbed all my stuff and pulled out my pocket knife. He then left the store and hung out right outside the only entrance or exit. I didn't want to leave but I couldn't stay inside the mall. I waited for him to go out of sight and then quickly locked the doors and I ran outside to my car. I called my manager and she said that I have to close the store properly, turn off the lights and count the register and all that. So she told me to go into a nearby store in the mall and call a security escort. I did that, was escorted back to the store to close up and was also escorted back to my car with no further incident. Now, I live in a city with one of the highest rates of human and sex trafficking in the country and I genuinely believe that I was being targeted by a human trafficker that day. I know hearing this secondhand, it may not exactly seem that way, but if you had been there and if you had heard the creepiness and the phone conversation, I honestly think that you would agree with me. I, a female and 26, live in a flat building in a good area. It's a long, windy cul-de-sac, so there's not many cars coming in and out unless it's people leaving or coming home from work. My boyfriend, he's away in Thailand for a month, and we usually take the dog out together at night. I went myself, which I was fine with. I mean, I usually feel safe. But last week at around 8pm, I left the flat to take my dog for a pee, 
My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. She just had a spray surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I'm waiting for my dog to do her business and a car pulls in and drives slowly past me. The guy did a friendly sort of neighborly nod towards me, so I did a smile back, you know, to be polite and all. The guy parks at the front of the building and I'm at the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog trying to get her to hurry up because it was freezing. I look up and the man is stood outside of his car, staring at me now. A little freaked out by this, I turn my attention back to my dog. I keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring with a really creepy and weird smile on his face. I looked away again for a second and he was walking along the road slowly towards us. I'm a really friendly person. I can be paranoid and aware at times. I know that, as any woman should be at night. But something about him made me feel scared. He's walking so slow as if he wants to talk to me, so I hide behind a van. I know, not my brightest idea. And I'm telling my dog, hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore all of a sudden, though, which terrified me, to be honest. All I hear are footsteps coming towards us. The guy peeks his face around the van and my dog goes absolutely nuts. She's jumping around, barking aggressively, which she never does with people, and the guy doesn't take that as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that she doesn't want his presence, but even though she's doing this, he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and say to him to please leave as she's just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet, sinister voice too, he asks, what's your name? I couldn't really hear him, to be honest. He kept repeating the question as well, and I eventually understood what he was asking. My dog is still going absolutely nuts at him, mind you. I say again, please, my dog just had surgery. You need to walk away, she's too excited. Ignored again. Walks towards us, asking my name, so I start walking away from him. He seems to ponder for a minute, still smiling, creepily may I add. He eventually backs up slowly, still facing me, and I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds, walking backwards like that, never letting his eyes off of me. Eventually though, he walks back to his car normally, looks over his shoulder at me, then stands back at his car and stares for another three minutes. I pretend that my dog is doing something when she's really just being a pain in the butt and just standing there. I look up and all of a sudden he's gone. I'm shaking now, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on. She's telling me just go inside, but she doesn't realize that I'm frozen in fear. Eventually though, I, I see a woman and her son rock up at the front door, so I half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. At the front of our building has glass doors. I glance in and the man is standing there waiting for us. I told the woman, this man has been following me and my dog and I'm scared, and she walks in with me. The man sees that I'm not alone and walks right past us out of the building again. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock my doors. I decided to tell my two male neighbors about it, as my boyfriend is away and they agree to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration plate, as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work and I want her to be wary of him obviously. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11am, just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building and as we're headed to the lift, I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He was looking for me and he started walking towards me. At first I didn't recognize him, but then he smiled his creepy smile and I realized who it was instantly. He said hi, so I said hey, then beeline for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I press the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me. Again, my dog is going absolutely nuts at him. He asks what my name was. He has an accent. He asked again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, what, my dog's name or mine? He goes yours and smiles. I froze and I said a fake name. And then he started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention, the lift was about to open and I could run away, but he told me his name and I replied, nice to meet you, 
Finally, the lift doors opened. I walk in and I press the button to my floor, hoping that he would leave me alone. But he ran behind me as I walked in and went, I'd like to see you again. That was weird. I was creeped out. I replied that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. As I said this, the lift doors were closing, and he tried to stick his hand out to stop the lift from closing. But thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was afraid that he was going to run up so that he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get into my home and lock the doors. The lift opens, and thankfully he's not there, so I beeline to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs, and I swear that I saw someone coming up. I ran in, I locked the front door as quickly as I could, and I was just so confused about what just happened. The next thing that I do is message everyone with the update. They told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on a record, so I did that, and the police arrived at my flat at 3pm. I explained everything to them, and they said that I could either A, get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off, or B, next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone, and if he doesn't, phone the police as it would then be considered harassment. For now, the police really couldn't do more, which is fair enough, I guess. I didn't want to anger him at this stage, as it's not a, a crime at this point, I guess you could say, but why can't he just leave me alone? I have no idea. I mean, I clearly showed that I was not interested, and it just annoys me that this is happening to me. I hate saying something's going on when maybe it isn't, but I just have a terrible gut feeling that there's something very wrong with this guy and that this is not the last that I'll see of him. This all happened way back in 1985 and 1986, but they are things that my friend and I will never forget. So I was working the summers at an old retreat in the North Carolina mountains with about 50 other young adults. It was great fun too. And while the place had lots of modern buildings, it was ruled over by a hulking white building built in 1912. I think it's important to note too that most of the building is just an extension of the mountain itself. It was built using the trees from the right where it stands as well as the rocks and the shoulders used for the foundation. It's three stories but really five counting the basement and the attic full of bats. It was great watching them pour out of there every night too. The front of the building is an enormous portico with white columns stretching up all three stories. That porch is full of rocking chairs from which you can see a majestic view of the Smoky Mountains. But the back of the building is where we worked. We entered our housekeeping facilities via a fire escape that stretched straight up to the second floor rear entrance, a single green metal door. That door was one that I knew well. Housekeeping was my department for three summers, and even though this was now just the end of this first summer, I was well acquainted with it already. It was big, green, metallic, and heavy as all heck, with a pull on the outside and a bar to push on the inside to open it. It didn't stay open though, in fact fire regulations required that it stay closed at all times, and it was engineered to shut automatically too. So of course, during the summer with no air conditioning in the building, we kept it propped open with a full bucket of water during the day, regulations be damned. Anyway, a few nights before we left, we were all cleaning our dorms and trying to turn it into a party when we all ran out of cleaning supplies. So around 9 o'clock at night, my best friend and I drive our lazy butts down to the back of the building. It was only a short distance, but there was a very steep incline that we didn't want to walk down. I parked my car right in front of the stairs and we got out. At this point, we both began to feel odd too. For some reason, the air was still and stuffy and... I felt positively enveloped by this building, standing in the middle with those massive wings rising around us. The building was completely dark, and since we had been shutting it down for the winter, it was already locked up tight. My friend had been with me earlier in the day when I had locked that door, the one at the top of the stairs. As we climbed the stairs, I felt really oppressed and had to sort of stop for a moment. My friend did too. I told him that... I was scared and he admitted the same which was really weird. I had never felt scared of this building before and 
I'd spent plenty of time in it alone, exploring the basement and even the attic. Trying to push our feelings aside though, we pressed slowly forward again and a few steps up, I just literally felt an icy chill go down my spine. I know it's a stupid cliche, but I've never felt anything like it before or since then, like someone pressed an icicle down the length of my spine. Finally, we reached the top of the stairs and the instant that I put my foot on the top landing, that door swung open wide as anything and stood open for us, revealing the short entranceway bathed in the red light of the exit sign. It almost seemed like whatever it was, it wanted us in there and we both felt it, but it didn't feel welcoming at all. In fact, I've never been more scared of anything in my life. I still get freaked out about it now, 37 years later. But we both stood there, completely stunned for what felt like minutes before I just freaked out, started screaming incoherently and scrambled down the steps, jumping way too many on the way down. We both ran up the steep incline yelling and screaming, leaving my car behind. Everyone came running down and searched the building with us. And it was empty, of course. And when we got back... The door was shut fast and locked when we got there. No one could have pushed that door open, mind you, and run away without us hearing them. The floors squeaked when you walked on them, and somebody running would have been very loud. I've looked at this from every angle that I can think of, but I still have no explanation for what happened that night. I worked there for three more summers in that building and have more stories too, but this one... This one always stuck with me. But my friends stayed to work through the winter one year too, and they even saw what they described as a dark man with a hat in the same building. There was something really odd and eerie about that building, and I don't know what it was, but whatever it is, it seems evil. So my boyfriend, Jason, 27 male, and I, 23 year old female, went on a month long trip camping to multiple states. Everything had been going really well until October 9th, when we decided to ditch a campground reservation and we randomly pitch our tent near an Albion Basin within the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far off the lake trailhead there. We parked our car around 3pm at the Albion Basin campground closed for season. Admittedly it was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear or anything. Upon arrival we realized the area that we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point we started to express regret as we had planned a campsite in Nephi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. So after grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear that we had to get through the night as it was going to be 25 Fahrenheit out. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel a bit strange though, as if we didn't really even know why we were doing this. As if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night, but... We both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to the lake. Totally empty, so nothing like the pictures. It was disappointing and eerie, to be honest. Whatever. We keep hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land when we stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a heck no kind of situation, but... After he checked it out, he says that it seems like a small animal crawl space, so no biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, play some cards, bundle up, and decided to go to bed early, around 8.30pm, as we planned to leave ASAP in the morning, maybe 5. We both sort of dwindle slowly, and after what feels like 30 minutes, I woke up abruptly at 11.24pm. I woke up with a, a feeling that I'd never experienced before. I woke up wide awake, scared but unprovoked, and as if there was no way in heck that I was going to fall back to sleep, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I let him be and I just laid there, alert, trying to listen to anything that I could hear, which was nothing. It was very silent, in fact. 
Around 12am, Jason woke up stirring, but much to my delight as I didn't want to feel alone anymore. I told him that I couldn't sleep, but he suggested that I rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby, and I say I was pretty scared. This was very short-lived though, as Jason couldn't fall back asleep himself, and we ended up laying there together, trying to sleep, when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. Eventually though, we agreed that it was fine for us to just stick it through the night, as it was now approaching 2.30 in the morning anyway, and we had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I did not need to be frightened. But not even five minutes later, but we're still wide awake and Jason's head perks up so fast that my heart jumped out of my chest and I whispered, what is it? He replied, listen. And I kid you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots as if someone walked up to our tent, stopped, and then walked to my side of the tent. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts and for a millisecond, I was convinced that it was a ranger coming to tell us that we couldn't camp there. So I called out, hello, my brain entirely sure that I had heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and bursted out of the tent for any chance to confront this person as I knew that he heard exactly what I had heard. But to our absolute shock, nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason bursted out and me after him, there was nobody there. But that made no sense because we definitely heard something or someone walk up so clearly, but nothing walked away. We hardly exchanged two words and we just packed up our stuff looking over our shoulders terrified, feeling watched the entire time, and we booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way, too scared to turn on our flashlights. This was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder to find someone following us. But when we made it to our car, we locked the doors and we started the descent out of the mountains almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached the town at about 3.30 in the morning and we slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store after that. We have obviously since discussed what happened that night and we are both still haunted by the sound of those footsteps that we heard that night. This was a few years ago now. It was pretty late, past 1.30 or 2 in the morning. I was living with this boy who was pretty abusive and he had gotten really jealous at this party that we were at earlier that night. Not even an hour after we had gotten home, he tossed me out onto our front porch and locked the door behind me. I was knocking and pleading for him to please let me back inside. I was still wearing what I had worn to the party and it was freezing out. I really wasn't sure what to do. He had my phone, purse, and wallet in the house with him, so I just sat on the porch, crying. When he turned off the lights, both inside and outside of the house, I knew that he wasn't going to let me back in. I felt really helpless and cold, and I thought about knocking on a neighbor's door, though he didn't have many, but I had anxiety about waking anyone up and causing trouble for my boyfriend too, so... Instead, I decided that I would try to walk to this gas station and motel, which was like a little less than a mile away, so I could use their phone to try and call a girlfriend of mine to see if I could sleep over with her. Ironically enough, the road that I was walking on, Donna Pass Road, being so freezing cold was fitting. But anyway, a little bit into the walk, this tall white pickup truck was approaching on the opposite side of the road that I was on. I tried not to make eye contact for obvious reasons, but then I heard the truck stopping and beginning to make a U-turn, and my heart just started pounding when that happened. I just about froze up, but forced myself to speed walk at the very least, and the truck pulled up to me and this guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing out this late. I told him how I was going to meet my friend at the gas station and that she was expecting me. He sort of smiled and offered me a ride. I said no thank you, citing that I shouldn't hitchhike, and he told me, well good, I don't pick up hitchhikers or anyone, you don't look like a hitchhiker though, you just look like you need some help. 
He just kept driving next to me and told me that I shouldn't think that he was a creep and he pulled out what looked like a police badge and told me that he had just gotten off duty which is why he was in civilian clothes and out so late. He said that he wouldn't mind driving next to me just to make sure that I get where I was heading safely. I'll admit that I was naive and a bit too trusting of his kindness and credentials and when he offered me a ride again I said that it would be nice because the gas station wasn't that far away anyway. So he popped the door open for me and I hopped in. The radio was low. It was a little messy. The ashtray was full of cigarettes. But there were a lot of newspapers on the passenger floor. And as I was moving my feet, some of the papers shifted showing a, a pair of handcuffs, some coffee cups, empty water bottles, rags, a highlight colored bandana, and a few other things. He apologized, saying that it was the truck that he took hunting, but it was super warm, so I was happy and I didn't mind at all. He told me his name was John. He asked why I was scantily dressed with a jacket, and I started to tell him about the party and the fight that I had with my boyfriend. He was super charming, actually, and really attentive. He even laughed that he could go back and arrest him if I wanted. I asked about him, and he told me about his family. He was a young dad. He had a wife, a daughter, a son, and a dog. I told him that it was like he had the perfect little family, and he laughed and said that he certainly did. Then it had sort of clicked for me to ask him if I could use his phone, but he said no because he had to save his battery. We were approaching the gas station, and then he drove right past it. I politely said, oh, I think that's the one, but he didn't answer me. It was then that... I felt sick to my stomach and my heart started pounding again. I started getting choked up, my eyes started tearing up and I was looking out of the windows and watching the lights behind us getting further and further away. It was hard for me to even speak but somehow I murmured, asking if he could please turn around and he just ignored me. Whenever I would look at him, he just looked empty eyed and emotionless, totally dead and glazed. I looked back out the window and down at the road to see if maybe we were going slow enough that I could make a leap out of the car without seriously injuring myself. I remember always hearing, never go to the second location, but I thought about the possibility of jumping out and breaking an ankle and how it would be a lot harder to get away with one foot as opposed to two, debating with myself that there was snow on the ground, but then again, snow is hard to get along in, and especially when you're not fully clothed like I was. I felt so stupid now too because I wasn't even tied up or anything. I was just so scared though, like there was nothing but trees, an empty road and me and this guy. I was crying pretty badly at this point and asked if I could please borrow his phone again. I don't know why I even asked, I think it was just anxiety and fear, but he told me to stop talking. Then he started talking underneath his breath saying, girls shouldn't be out so late. You shouldn't have been alone this late. Look what you're doing to me, dressed like that, and other derogatory things. As he kept saying these terrible things, too many to share here, I wasn't even responding. I was just crying and trying to think past the fear that I was feeling. I remembered the pair of handcuffs that I saw under the papers beneath my feet, so I used that little, I don't know how to describe it, like scoopy motion. I managed to use my feet to scoop the handcuffs up and I used my heels and toes to push them under the bottom of my seat as far as I could. I was thinking of different things that I could do to try and help myself, like if we were close enough to some upcoming lights or structures, if I ever made it to them, I could just grab the wheel and cause us to crash into them, or maybe how if I got lucky enough for a cop to pass us, I could grab the wheel and swerve so that he would appear to be a, a drunk driver and we'd get pulled over. I guiltily thought about the possibility of this man as just having a weird night and how if I did anything it would hurt him but I told myself that that sort of thinking sort of got me into this mess in the first place so I was done with that. He pulled off the road where there were still woods on both sides of us. On his side of the wooded trees were closer to the road and on mine there was a small gap fully covered in thick, I don't know how many feet of snow but it was a lot before the trees thickly picked up again, maybe 10 to 16 yards away. He turned off the car eventually and coldly said that there was something wrong with the car and to get out with him. 
as he grabbed the keys and was stepping out of the car, I grabbed onto the center console and I cried and pleaded not to make me get out with him because it was too cold. He turned around to face me, his door still open, and shouted at me to get out of the car because we had to go check out the trunk bed hatch. I dug my fingernails deeper into the console, thinking my cries of no and head shaking would cause him to come around to my side of the car and drag me out himself. I was crying and said, please John, I'm so cold and scared. I was thinking of everything that I'd ever heard, humanize yourself, use first names, stuff like this. He stared at me in this like way I can't even describe to this day. I don't even know how to start, but he got back in the car and I slinked towards my window, scared that he would drag me over the console. He turned off the headlights and everything just looked completely dark blue. He stared at the steering wheel for what felt like years before, lighting a cigarette and looking at his window, back at me and then back out his window. He heard me shuffle my feet on the newspapers. I was adjusting my legs. But while still staring out his window, he told me if I thought about running, he had a quick way to get me where he wanted me to be. And oddly enough, I was sort of thinking of running minutes before that. But I reasoned that if he wanted me out of the car, then I should definitely stay in. Otherwise, he could chase me or shoot me in case he had a hunting rifle in the back. I didn't dare look. And I'm glad that I was right. I think at that point I sort of hit some sort of bottom of my reserve and instead of panic, there was numbness and exhaustion. There was still an occasional hot tear or two, but I just remember being numb at this point. I talked to a psychiatrist about this sort of thing and he thinks it's just some from my ex-boyfriend giving me PTSD or something. But it was dead quiet. I finally just barely audibly told him that my friend was still waiting for me and asked about his wife and children and he flatly said that he didn't have a wife or children and that his house was empty. I asked him what he was thinking about and he said, I'm thinking about what to do with you. He didn't say it angrily though, he just said it flatly and coldly which honestly scared me even more. I did start getting worked up to a cry and at that point he told me not to cry and turn the car on offering me some heat but I just cried and said that I wanted to go home. Eventually he started driving and kept driving until we were approaching a gas station. I was gauging the right time to reach for the wheel but before I could he started slowing down. While pulling up, he told me not to tell anyone or he would find me. Then he told me all he was doing was teaching me a lesson not to hitchhike with strangers. He was almost coming to a complete stop when he told me to get out before he changes his mind. Before he could even get another look at me to assess my understanding, I was already down out of that truck and sprinting towards the gas station. The panic was overwhelming me, but then I stopped and remembered to try and see his license plate. I turned around but only caught the blur of the last three numbers as he was driving off. I ran inside and asked the clerk behind the counter to please call the police. I waited until the officer got there and I'll be honest, I was a little scared that it would be John. My fears melted away when a new faced policeman got there. I gave him the description of John, his appearance, the vehicle color and the type the parts of the license plate number that I had caught, the fact that he said that he was an off-duty cop, just basically anything that I could give him. I asked him if he could look at the camera and the officer disappeared in the back for a little bit, then came back out saying that there was really not much on them. I asked if I would be able to look and the officer said no and asked me if I didn't trust him and I told him of course I did. The officer gave me a ride home to my friends though, lecturing me for hitchhiking, consisting of him repeatedly asking if I knew who Ted Bundy was. Of course I knew. I was just naive to think that it would never happen to me and I was desperate for some warmth. In the end, I never heard anything back about the report that was made too, so I would try to follow up and each time that I did, they never got back to me, aside from this one time that I was told that my case number didn't exist but that didn't stop me from trying to follow up. Throughout the months and years, I asked my friend, whose home I slept over at that one night, if uh, she ever heard of any like weirdness or anything since that incident had happened to her or anyone up here, and she always says no. So in the end, I 
just sort of had to let it go and try to tell myself that maybe he actually was just trying to teach me a lesson or something. I mean, I definitely never hitchhiked again, so if it was a lesson, it certainly worked. I never heard anything back having to do with the case. I never heard of any other odd experiences up there. Maybe it was just one man trying to teach me something. But honestly, sometimes I think that I tell myself all of that to help me sleep better at night. Because it all felt very, very real. But even if it wasn't real, I'm really glad that I didn't get out of the car in the woods that night. So I used to work in a factory, third shift, 12 hours every night. You'd rely on your partner at work to talk all night to get you through the shift and I always enjoyed teaming up with this particular dude because we both hold convos well and always have some interesting stuff to say. Anyways, I'm like 27 at the time and he's in his 50s. I figured that he'd have a crazy story or two so I asked him about paranormal stuff if he'd experienced anything. He tells me this unbelievable story that I have to say is either true or he copied it from some Amazing Stories episode from the 80s or something like that. But here it is. So there's a town in Ohio that's very old, very wild, forests, but not much around there except a farm or two. And he claims that each time he went out there, he would notice that his watch would malfunction or his compass would act weird and he'd have missing time and things of that nature. So, him and his buddy were out there hunting in this forest one day. They hunt all day, don't think that they killed anything, but they decided to leave. But they're hiking back when a dude, about 30 years old, approaches them on a dirt road on a tractor. Clearly a, a farmer type guy. He questions my co-worker and friend and tells them that they're hunting on his property. They immediately apologize and strike up a conversation and the farmer man takes a, a likening to them. Tells them that the next time that they're out there, if they should get approached or have any issues, just mention his name and they'll be okay. Well, two or so years go by and they get together again to go hunt on this property. A similar thing happens where a young man riding on a mower or a tractor approaches them and they realize that this is a different guy. They tell the young man that they have permission to be there from the owner, farmer guy from before. And he proceeds to tell me that the young man that they were speaking to gives him a strange look. The man says, You're telling me my farmer man told you guys a couple of years ago that you could hunt out here? They said yes and described the prior interaction. The young man looks puzzled and tells them to follow him back to his old farmhouse. They go inside and there's a very old man on a hospital type bed in the living room watching TV and hooked up to oxygen. The young man says, Hey dad, these men claim that you talked to them a couple of years ago and gave them permission to hunt? The old man looks at my co-worker and his friend in bewilderment and says, I remember you two. You guys haven't aged a day. It creeped them out obviously, but anyways, I guess they talked for a while when they left and they never went back there after that. Too freaked out by seeing this guy so old after what had only been like a couple of years. But I would like to know what you guys think. Do you guys think this story is just something made up? Is this guy that I worked with full of it? Or is there something truthful going on here? So me and my four buddies drew into a two day hunt on a reserve. Day one, about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a really fat black bear we only had muzzle loaders. They're like a Civil War style gun that you get one shot with when you're going to reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer, so at 2pm after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We find a hellacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him pick me up and I'll be on the road after dark. He's about 7 miles away. I sit there from 2pm till dark. All I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway, so it gets dark and I creep down to the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see, something comes crashing in the thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I think to myself, huh, maybe it's a deer. 
So I grunt cold just to get a reaction, but nothing. So I creep on thinking that I can bust it if it's a deer. But it doesn't budge. It's sniffing like a dog would. I kick the ground and stomp trying to bump it, but it just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear and I'm like 10 feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm going to have to hip shoot it if it is a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot, a big bull elk off to my right in the full moonlight, staring too at whatever this thing is. I see something drive out of the bushes into the thicket across the road to my left so I run further out and it's a standoff. I shine my light into the thicket and I see eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart at least, uh, maybe four foot off the ground and it's just sniffing over and over again. At this point I'm like, where's my bro? It's full dark and this thing is stalking me and using cover. My buddy's light starts shining down the road and this thing crashes through the bushes away from us. At first I figure that it must be a bear but thinking back on it, I really don't know what it was to be honest. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before. Whatever it was, I was turtle heading, I'm not going to lie. I had one shot in the dark, coyotes howling like crazy too. Predators were out in full effect on the full moonlight, the bull next to me and I don't know, it was a weird night and I don't know what that thing was but like I said, it's like nothing I'd ever seen. So yesterday, while returning home from my work, I was exhausted and at some point I strayed from my routine way back home and I decided to sit down on a bench at a small park. The park was empty at the time and about five minutes later, a young man that I'd say he was in his late 20s to early 30s, dressed in a business suit, holding a briefcase, sat on the bench across from me and started to occasionally stare at me. Later on, he got up and sat next to me on a bench and said, How are you, Jennifer? He had a British accent and he was speaking in a very exaggerated manner. I was surprised and thought that this was someone that I must have known from college or high school that I just didn't remember at the time. And when I asked how he knew my name, he simply replied, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then put his briefcase to his lap and clasped his hands on top of the briefcase. At this point I started to feel worried and I asked him again how he knew me but before I could finish my sentence he interrupted me and said I'll get into it in a little while but first let me ask you are you satisfied with where you're living right now and then just said my entire address. He then said what are your thoughts on your workplace are you satisfied with your wage and then he correctly stated my wage. At this point I was getting really creeped out by him and asked him who he was again and he calmly replied it doesn't matter at this point or moment I don't recall what exactly he said but right now what matters is that I want to help you he then went on to state a lot of personal information about me that I wouldn't think anyone would ever know and he especially knew a lot about my personal relationships about people that I know as he was saying all this stuff, I started to pack up my things and got up from the bench and asked who he was and what he wanted in a sort of worried manner. He didn't answer me and told me to calm down. I then yelled at him asking what the heck he wanted from me and who he was and he didn't say anything and he did this very weird thing where he sort of rolled his eyes first and then slowly turned his head behind as if someone was standing behind him and just said, very well then. The way he did that was so strange though, like almost as if he was a character giving the camera a side eye and breaking the fourth wall. He picked up his briefcase, got up from the bench and he started to approach me. I tried to reach for the pepper spray in my bag but he grabbed my arm and said no need for that, pushed me away and I lost my balance and fell to the ground and then he quickly walked away. Obviously, I was really scared after falling to the ground and didn't know what to do for a solid minute. When I got back up, I went the way that he walked away, but I didn't see him. Which was strange because I should have been able to. It was then that I decided to just get out of the park and just go home. 
Overall, his mannerisms were really strange and he used his hands in a sort of elegant manner a lot when he talked, like as if he was a theatrical actor and as I stated before, he spoke in a British accent, I live in the US, and spoke theatrically as well if that makes sense. He was tall, very well dressed, clean shaven, had short slicked hair and was wearing circular glasses. Another detail that I noticed was that he had this square pin on the lapel of his blazer. The pin was white and it had sort of like a little black trident on it. I obviously haven't gone to the police yet, but I do intend to, but I really don't know what to say or what evidence to provide apart from a small wound on my hand. Is there a place where I can ask for some advice about what to do about this situation? I'm a bit lost in all this and I just don't know what to think of it. I don't really remember this very clearly since I must have been 7 or 8 at the time, so I had to ask my mum for some details about this. This all started when I was at Target going back to school shopping. I was looking at some backpacks when this woman comes up to me and starts talking to me and my mum. She was asking my mum questions about me like how old I am, what grade I'm in, what school I go to, etc. She had two kids with her, so my mum was a little confused why she was looking at Hello Kitty backpacks, but she said that she was looking for some for her niece. My mum is feeling a little bit weird about this, but mostly just brushes it off. Until this tall, bald guy comes from the other side of the aisle and sort of blocks my mum's exits. So my mum is really getting nervous now, until somebody else goes into the aisle and my mum takes that as an opportunity to leave. Cut to a year later, I'm shopping with my mum at a Coles and there's these display beds everywhere and I always like laying on every single bed as a kid anyway. I don't notice him but my mum notices a, a tall bald man staring at us while on the phone. The man never talked nor will he ever talk during the rest of our interactions but my mum tells me that it's time to get up from the bed and continue shopping and she keeps an eye on him and notices that he and a woman are just walking around the store with an empty cart, not buying anything. This was in the summer and I needed new swimming goggles, so I was looking at some until the man and the woman, they come up to us. The woman asks, do they have those goggles in adult sizes? And just as they ask, my mum realizes that they are the same man and woman from a year ago in Target. She says, uh, no, they only have kid sizes and then quickly grabbed my arm and walked away. Many years later, I'm in eighth grade and I was in health class. We were in sex ed unit and we were learning about human sex traffickers and how to avoid them. I went through the lesson and nothing came to me until I was in the car with my mom driving home and I was thinking about the lesson. You see, one thing specifically stuck in my mind. My teacher said that sometimes these traffickers would have women do all the talking to make people feel more comfortable in the situation. And then I get that memory of the man and the woman. The woman talked a lot and the man didn't say a single thing. I start putting together all the pieces and noticing that they were showing the same signs the lessons were showing us. So then finally I turned to my mum who was driving and said, Mum, I think those people in the coals... They may be human traffickers. We sort of looked at each other and she nodded and said, Yeah, I think they've been following us for quite some time now. So I must think about this a couple of times a year at least. And I've looked it up, but I've never found anything similar. This happened a few years ago. So one night, my now wife and I were driving back from Sonic. We lived in a very old, very small town in West Texas. It was raining, but not heavily. Puddles on the ground. Wet enough that it would be weird for someone to be walking around, though. On top of that, there's a lot of roads with little or no lighting, so lots of the roads are mostly dark at night. We were driving down one such road when this happened. As my wife and I were driving, I looked to my right and I saw... Well, what I can only describe to be a faceless man. Not deformed, but like actually faceless. His face was white, or really all of him looked white. 
He looked almost like a blur or something, and his arms seemed impossibly long, almost down to the ground, in fact, and were moving in just a really unnatural way. Arms swinging back and forth aimlessly, but also very fast. But the best that I can describe this man's movements is that he sort of looked like he was glitching. But we weren't moving fast, probably 25 miles per hour, because we were in a residential area. I looked at him long enough that I had time to wonder what I was looking at before he went out of my view. For a second, I even wondered if someone was using a weed whacker or doing yard work, but of course not. I mean, it was 9pm and raining. I said nothing to my wife, assuming that my eyes must have just been playing tricks on me. I mean, it was dark, and maybe the rain blurred the window. I didn't know. But a couple of hours later, my wife asked me if I noticed the man on the side of the road that had no face. I could barely believe my ears, and it's still the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. So, I'm wondering if anyone might know what this might be called, or if anyone who's had a similar experience might be willing to share it with me. I still have no idea what this was, but I'm trying really hard to find out more information, so if you can help me, I would really appreciate it. This happened three years ago when I was still in high school. My school is very far from my home, so I ride the train each day. Sometimes a friend would go with me too. We would usually encounter our classmates along with her boyfriend in front of us. We never really spoke with each other, but we know that it's them because of their size differences, her height. Our classmate is a girl and she's very small, smaller than the average small height really, and I think she's around my chest level in fact, and I'm just around 156 centimeters. She also has curly hair, which is rare in my country. Her boyfriend is tall and quite big. My friend and I would always try to walk past them on the way to the train, and we would never really greet them because we're too shy, but hey, whatever. Now one day we had a group project over at another classmate's house. That girl, the classmate, was also invited, and we started getting to know each other a bit. She told me that she thinks that I'm pretty cool and wants to be friends with me and that she would always see me entering the school at around 9 in the morning, but she's too shy to approach me. I went silent because, as far as I know, I'm always late for class. I would be at the school at around 12pm or 12.30pm, never too early. I told her that that couldn't be me, but she told me that it really was me. She told me the details of how I would get off my ride and cross the highway running like a penguin. Well, she's actually kind of right, to be honest. Everyone tells me that I ran a bit like a penguin when I have a backpack on me. She continued explaining that I wore a blue hoodie, black and yellow Adidas bag, and a huge black headphone set, so it would be easy to identify me. Now, our country has a lot of hot weather, and no one would wear stupid hoodies during the daytime except for me. I then told her about how my friend and I also saw her and her boyfriend every day after school on the way to the train station. She looked at me weirdly and told us that that wasn't them and that they actually go the opposite way. They actually don't have anything to do with that train station. Hearing that, I must admit that I got chills. I defended what I said though when I told her that it was definitely them, that she must be making it up just to, you know, have a joke with me or something. I know that her boyfriend wears white glasses and that that's also rare because I haven't seen a guy at our school who even wears the same glasses. But we started exchanging weird looks and I asked her if she's messing with me. She then texted her boyfriend and asked him about how she would always point out to him that she sees me during 9am entering the school grounds. She asked her boyfriend what I wore and he explained clearly a blue hoodie, black headphones, black yellow bag running like a penguin across the street. So, apparently, they would see me at 9 in the morning entering the school and I would see them walking to the train station at around 7pm. And, to be honest, none of this makes any sense. After our conversation happened though, those, or whatever they were, they never showed up again. Like, we tried to confirm with each other, but we, or whatever they were, were just never there again. I still think about this incident every day after years and it was the most bizarre thing that I've ever been a part of. It continued to happen until we noticed it and 
It just stopped after we found out about it, which is so strange. I've been with different classmates on the way to the train, so I have other witnesses too, and we've all confirmed that we definitely saw them. We never knew why this happened, or if it was doppelgangers or what, but what would have happened to us if we approached those, well, things? A part of me says that we're lucky that we didn't approach them, because who knows what those things are. This must have happened nearly 20 years ago now, when I was five, I think. So my family lived in a trailer park, and I basically had free reign to roam around as long as I didn't actually leave the trailer park itself. One rainy day, a friend and I decided to meet at the playground in the center of the trailer park and just hang out, as kids do. Usually, we would have stayed at the playground, but for some reason that day, we felt like just walking around, seeing what kind of adventures that we could get ourselves into. This ended up being an awful idea, and the adventure was not fun in the slightest. Due to the rain, there weren't a lot of people hanging around outside that day, so the streets we were walking down were pretty much empty. At one point, a car pulls up next to us. The driver was a kind of thin guy with a moustache. In the passenger seat was a much bigger, bold man. They both looked old enough to be my dad. The driver rolls down his window, though, and looks us up and down. Are you kids a little young to be walking around by yourselves? He said. I should uh, probably preface this by saying that, at this point in time, I hadn't quite grasped the concept of stranger danger yet. I obviously smiled at him and replied, Nope, my mum says I can go anywhere I want in the park. My friend kicked me, and when I shot around to ask her what her problem was, she had a serious look on her face and was shaking her head no. Luckily, my friend was way smarter than me at that age and did already have a, a bit of a handle on the concept of stranger danger. The driver continues, Well, you might get sick if you stay out in this rain too long, but why don't you let us give you a ride home? My friend shook her head at the man. Uh, no thank you. She then proceeded to grab my hand and started pulling me away, moving ever so slightly faster than our previous pace. The car slowly crept next to us, the driver not giving up that easily. Really? I insist. I wouldn't want you guys to catch a cold or something. My friend kept pulling me forward and, without even looking at him, replied in a slightly firmer tone. No thank you, we're fine. She started walking even faster, me finally picking up on her energy and matching my pace to hers. Then we heard a car door open. I took a quick glance back and saw that the larger man, who hadn't said a word at this point, was getting out of the car. My panic mode kicked in and I shouted run as I turned to start running through the grass and in between people's trailers. I heard my friend running directly behind me too. We didn't have any idea where we were running to, we just knew that we had to get away from those men. After a bit, we saw her teenage cousin's trailer. We sprinted to it and burst through the door. Luckily, they were home and it was unlocked. We locked the door behind us and frantically looked out the windows, breathing a sigh of relief as we saw no sign of the men or their car. The friend's cousin ran into the room and, upon seeing us breathing heavily and clutching our chests, asked us what the heck was going on. My friend told her everything that happened and she told us to sit down on the couch and relax a bit, just happy that we were okay. We ended up staying there for a few hours, I think watching Disney movies. Her cousin then drove us to our respective homes, telling us that she doesn't want us walking around without a grown-up or a bigger kid like her anymore, and I had absolutely no protest to that after this experience. I never did see those two men again, and really, I don't think that they were from this area at all. And at the age of 23, I still sometimes lose sleep wondering what would have happened if my friend hadn't been so smart that day, or if we hadn't been able to outrun that guy. I shudder to think what would have happened to us. So this takes place when I was around 17 and living with my parents. It was the weekend and I was chilling in my room while my parents were out grocery shopping. When I was home alone, I always made sure to lock the door, including a lock that could only be unlocked from the inside, which made me feel extra safe. And due to that, 
When I heard the keys in the lock, I knew that it was my parents and I immediately opened the door for them. At first I used to look through the peephole to make sure that it was them, but I just stopped after a while and I just assumed that it was them. Well, that day my parents came back early and as usual I opened the door for them after hearing the keys in the door. And maybe 20 minutes after they came back, I was in my room when I heard a noise coming from the front door. I went to investigate and it sounded like someone was inserting something in the lock or trying to open the door with the wrong keys or something. I immediately warned my dad who went to open the door and we saw a man, he seemed to be in his 40s, trying to open the door. My dad at first thought that it was a confused neighbor and told him that he got the wrong apartment but the man didn't answer just stood there with a blank expression staring at me. His whole demeanor gave me a bad feeling and I told my dad to stop talking and close the door. After standing there for a few seconds, not responding, the man ran down the stairs, even though there is an elevator, and left the building. My dad was amused by the whole thing and I just went back to what I was doing. But thinking back on it later in the day, I realized that if my parents came back just 20 minutes later, I would have rushed to open this door to this man thinking that it was them. He obviously wasn't a confused neighbor since I never saw him in the building before and his reaction was really odd as well. I also realized that by taking the stairs, he avoided being seen by the camera facing the elevator. So this guy must have been scoping out the place and he also must have known that by just trying the door like he did, that I would have opened it. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night and I always checked before opening the door after that. So I'm sharing this because I would like to get more insight as to what was going on. I, male, was five years old, so this was 42 years ago now, and I didn't know anything about the paranormal back in those days. My mum was going into labour with my younger brother, so mum and dad had me stay at my grandparents for a couple of days, and it happened over Christmas. Christmas morning was great. I still remember their silver vintage aluminum Christmas tree and the Crayola caddy that I unwrapped and had so wanted for so long. But that night, though, something strange and really terrifying happened. You see, I shared a queen bed with my grandfather. Side note, there were two bedrooms and my grandparents already slept in separate rooms for years because of snoring. I was woken in the middle of the night to the bed violently shaking. To give you a sense of the intensity, imagine the four legs of the bed were each sitting in industrial paint can mixes, synced up, turned on high. I had no idea what was going on, but I was scared to death. My grandfather, however, was still sleeping through all of this somehow. I tried desperately to shake him awake. Finally, he started to stir awake and instantly the bed stopped still. I asked him, Grandpa, what was making the bed shake? Why was the bed shaking? Groggily, he had no idea what I was talking about and said, The bed's not shaking. Go back to sleep. He turned back over and was snoring again in seconds. My adrenaline was completely jacked up and there was no way that I was falling back asleep anytime soon. So I just sat there in the dark, in the silence, waiting. There was ambient light from the outside that dimly lit the room. The bedroom door was open, which it normally was anyway, and at the foot of the bed you could look out the bedroom doorway down the hall and into the front room where the Christmas tree was. I sat up at the edge of the bed to look at the tree and as little kids Christmas trees give a sense of comfort I guess. As I looked at the tree, probably 30 feet away, I could see that something was different. Now sitting beside the tree was the silhouette or shadow shape of what I can only describe as an absolutely enormous Doberman dog. And by huge, I mean sitting on its haunches, it still had to be well over five feet tall. It just seemed to sit there and stare at me. No movement, no sound. And although I didn't get the sense that it was trying to get me, boy did it scare me. I hid under the covers and eventually I fell asleep and I woke up to a, a beautiful sunny winter morning. Now, nothing paranormal ever happened in that house again after this, to my knowledge at least. However, my grandfather would certainly turn out to be a complete monster. I'll spare you all the details, but 
It was incredibly abusive and it was terrible. Both of those grandparents have long since passed on and I often wonder if there was a connection between these demonic or poltergeist or whatever you want to call it activity and him. Did the activity cause him to act awful to people or was he already a terrible person? somehow unknowingly manifesting the activity himself. And while I know it's a long shot, if you have insight into beds violently shaking like this or huge dark shadows of dogs, I'd appreciate any feedback. To note too, this occurred likely right when my brother was actually being born a, a mile or two away, 3am local December 26, 1980 and maybe six hours after the Rendlesham forest incident that happened thousands of miles away in England. I'm unsure if these events are purely coincidental, but I just thought that I should mention them. So, I'll just get straight to it. Uh, around Monday or Tuesday of this week, I was sitting at my desk picking up my PlayStation controller as I had previously set it down. I looked over slightly and I saw something that appeared to be like a, a grey fog-like creature's head that was peeking out from under my desk that had pitch black where its eyes should be and a long stretched mouth, black as well. Of course, I reacted like any sane person and yelled and sort of jumped back. My brother asked me what was wrong and I tried to tell him that I just saw a face, but he didn't believe me. After that, nothing really happened besides when I would close my eyes and sleep, I would see a person burning. I could vividly see them grabbing at their face and it isn't lifelike though, it's sort of like a drawing I guess. It's been happening every time that I close my eyes to sleep, like I said. Thursday of this week, I was trying to sleep again. I was restless so I rolled over to see if there was anything going on in the room. And I looked to my door, keep in mind my lights are off, and see a tall jet black figure who can barely fit in my doorway, average doorway mind you. The thing was very skinny, it looked like it was studying me, like I was a creature to be watched in a petting zoo or something. The creature looked like it was moving its head around but I couldn't see it well because it didn't have any facial features and my room was dark. Whenever I saw it I locked eyes with it for like 10 to 15 seconds and I rubbed my eyes to make sure that I wasn't seeing things and the creature started to, well, it seemed like chuckle. Its arms grabbed at its sides as if it was the funniest joke that it's ever seen, but it didn't make any sound. I turned over and turned back to it, and when I did it was still there, it didn't leave. I yelled at my brother to turn on the lights, but of course I took my eyes off the thing to look at my brother, but as soon as I turned back to whatever this thing was, it had vanished. I tried to play it off cool and acted like I wanted to go into the closet and change into more comfortable clothes. I did and then I went back to try to go to sleep and that night I refused to look at that door again. 